okay. Look! Your blood comes from dukes. Them great houses. What we do, we do for the benefit of all. It's been two years since Denis Villeneuve's adaption of Frank Herbert's sci-fi epic Dune was released. Now the much-awaited Dune Part 2 is arriving with a whole host of new characters and lots more story. Here's everything you need to know about the first Dune before you go to see Dune Part 2. Arrakis, the spice planet. The planet Arrakis is the only source of spice, a psychotropic substance and an essential component of interstellar travel, making it the most valuable substance in the universe. Arrakis used to be controlled by House Harkonnen, but was turned over to House Atreides by the Emperor. Arrakis is an inhospitable desert planet, whose indigenous people are called the Fremen. Led by Javier Badim's Stilga, the Fremen naturally distrust the off-worlders who come only to plunder the natural resources of the planet. But the Fremen have a trick up their sleeves. House Atreides. House Atreides is ruled by Duke Leto Atreides, played by a very renowned actor, Oscar Isaac, who is caught between a rock and a hard place when the Emperor commands him to take over Arrakis, suspecting that the Emperor has an ulterior motive. He sends his trusted lieutenant Duncan Idaho, who is Jason Momoa, to Arrakis to forge an alliance with the Fremen. Leto fears for the safety of his family, his concubine Lady Jessica and his son Paul, who is the main protagonist Timothy Chalamet. His fears prove true when House Atreides is double-crossed on Arrakis. Most of his forces, including trusted advisor Gurney Helek, are vanquished. Lady Jessica and Paul escape into the desert, but Leto dies in captivity. The Bene Gesserit, the voice. The Bene Gesserit is a powerful religious order and a political force. The Gesserit are a sisterhood who have trained for years to master superhuman powers and abilities that allow them to control other people using the voice. Lady Jessica is one of their acolytes and has been secretly training Paul on how to use the voice, but he is still a novice. Meanwhile, the Bene Gesserit have their own agenda with their leader, the Reverend Mother making a secret deal with Baron Valdemir Harakonnen, a deliciously evil Stellan Skarsgård. Paul's visions are Maudadeep. Young Paul has been seeing visions when he sleeps. He dreams of Arrakis and a mysterious Fremen girl. He confides in Jessica and Duncan about his visions, but is unable to understand anything more about them or whatever they mean. On Arrakis, exposure to the spice triggers even more intense visions. Paul sees the Fremen people chanting the name Modadib at him and thousands of them fighting a bloody holy war in his name. Paul understands that he is meant to be some kind of prophesied saviour a role he is reluctant to play. When he and Jessica are rescued in the desert by Stilgar's people, Paul meets Shami, Zendaya, the girl in his visions. Now, desert power or the sand bombs. When it comes to Arrakis, Duke Leto Atreides keeps talking about harnessing desert power. It's never really explained what desert power means, but it can refer to a number of things. Firstly, the conventional understanding of combat relies heavily on the powered body shield, which is useless in Arrakis. The Fremen have developed a fighting style which does not need a shield. Even the fiercest Atreides warrior Idaho says he almost died fighting a Fremen warrior. Desert power could also refer to the way in which the Fremen have developed tools to survive in desert like still suits which preserve body moisture, recycle it and feed it back to the wearer. Allowing the wearer to survive for weeks in open desert. But it's most unlikely that desert power alludes to the relationship of the Fremen with the sandworms. Think the dragons from Game of Thrones only much bigger. At the ends of First Dune, Paul sees a Fremen riding a sandworm, and you can be sure to see a lot more of them in Dune Part 2. Okay. Look!
your blood it comes from dukes and great houses. What we do, we do for the benefit of all. You are not prepared for what is to come. Well, 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 it will be a sin for me, a movie fan, who will not pry on the box office collections. Now here is the Hollywood famous Dune Part 2 and we'll be predicting the first day collections. So Dune Part 2 the sequel to its hit 2021 Dune Part 1 has been released in the theatres. The film starring Timothy Chalamet and Zendaya in the lead roles is targeting 80 to 90 million dollars at the worldwide box office at 70 markets on its opening weekend according to the guru of predictions which is me. The Warner Bros, the studio behind the sci-fi film, has projected a $65 million start in the US. However, the publication states that the most box office predictors believe the film might make $90 million in its opening weekend. The film was originally slated for release last year, but it was delayed due to Hollywood strike. Even the revenue has been down to 18% from 2023 and that Dune Part 2 might have the biggest opening weekend since even Five Nights at Freddy's which made $80 million. Might beat its predecessor Dune which was released in 2021 made $41 million on its opening weekend and made $402 million worldwide. Back then the film also streamed simultaneously on HBO Max. And to notice this part that the Dune Part 2 is this weekend's only release in India as well as US which means it gets more screens especially in IMAX and Dolby formats. The film has been made on a budget of $190 million and might benefit from a purely theatrical release unlike the first part of Dune. Well about Dune Part 2, Dune Part 2 is based on the second half of Frank Herbert's book set in fictional desert planet of Arrakis. Timothy plays Paul Atreides, the exiled Duke of House Atreides. Zendaya plays Shani, a young Fremen warrior. Austin Butler, Florence Pugh, Christopher Walken, Rebecca Ferguson, Josh Brolin and Stellan Skarsgård also star in the film. The film recently had its premiere and received good reviews. Dennis stated that he is also interested in making a third Dune film based on Dune Masiha, the second book in the series. Also if you wish to know the review of this movie, we'll put down the link in the description box. Please check it out. It's breathtaking. If you dive in, you can't reach the bottom. Well hello guys, Hollywood side se ek aur bohat badi movie saamne aai hai jiska naam hai Dune Part 2. Ab iski movie review ke baare mein baat kare to Dune Part 2 ki IMDB ke upar filhaal present rating hai 10 on 10. 9.9 bhi rahi 10 on 10. Samaj rahe ho? Nice. वैसे IMDb की रेटिंग तो ऊपर नीचे हो सकती है जैसे-जैसे रेटिंग बढ़ेगी ड्यून पार्ट 2 को देखने के लिए ऑडियंस पागल हो जाएगी खैर इसका पागलपन अभी भी कम नहीं है 2 घंटे 45 मिनट लंबी ड्यून पार्ट 2 2021 में आई पार्ट 1 का न्यू पार्ट है आउटस्टैंडिंग मूवी थी उसने आंखों की थेरेपी दे दी इतने आउटस्टैंडिंग विजुअल्स कलर ग्रेडिंग देखने की आदत नहीं है क्योंकि बॉलीवुड मूवीज अभी तक हॉलीवुड लेवल पर नहीं पहुंच पाई है ऐसी मूवीज आती हैं तो यह समझ आता है कि अभी भी बॉलीवुड को बहुत मेहनत करने की जरूरत है ऐसे ही फिल्म 6 ऑस्कर्स तो नहीं जीती थी वैसे ही सिनेमेटोग्राफी साउंड एडिटिंग म्यूजिक सब में ऑलमोस्ट ड्यून पार्ट 2 कम से कम 10 ऑस्कर जीतेगी इतने कुछ विजुअल काफी टाइम बाद देखने को मिले हैं लेकिन हां अगर आपको पार्ट 2 देखना है तो आपको पार्ट 1 देखना बहुत ज्यादा कंपलसरी है सिर्फ देखना कंपलसरी नहीं है आपको पार्ट 1 समझ में आना चाहिए क्योंकि पार्ट 2 के अंदर मूवी में फैमिली पॉलिटिक्स बहुत ज्यादा है और उसके ऊपर बहुत ज्यादा टाइम डेडिकेट किया गया है एक ड्रॉबैक है इसका कि मूवी बहुत ज्यादा स्लो लगती है ऐसा कोई भी कैरेक्टर ही नहीं है जो फटाफट डायलॉग बोल दे सब एकदम फुर्सत में स्लो मोशन में डायलॉग्स बोल रहे हैं अब वो शायद आपके लिए बहुत बढ़िया हो सकता है आपको मूवी फील करवा सकता है लेकिन ये चीज एनिमल पुष्पा ट्रिपल आर केजीएफ फास्ट फ्यूरियस देखने वाले फास्ट लोगों को बहुत बोर कर सकती है अब बात कर लें अगर मूवी के एक्शन के तो एक दो सीन्स ऐसे हैं जिससे कि आपकी आत्मा को तृप्ति मिल जाएगी निर्वाणा प्राप्त हो जाएगा मोक्ष मिल जाएगा देखिए ये वीडियो उन लोगों के लिए भी है जिन्होंने पार्ट 1 नहीं देखा है तो मैं चीजों को ऐसे बताऊंगा कि आपको कुछ स्पॉइलर भी ना मिले अब जब हम एक्शंस की बात कर ही रहे थे तो सबसे पहले जो उस रेगिस्तान के अंदर से जो मॉन्स्टर निकलता है और उसके ऊपर मतलब ज्यादा स्पॉइलर नहीं देंगे लेकिन वो सीन बहुत ही ज्यादा रिलेटिव लगा 
रिलेटिव लगा दोस्तों सब एक दूसरे से कनेक्टेड है इस मूवी के अंदर भी बहुत ही ज्यादा ग्रैंड लेवल पर आपको वाइड एंगल शॉट्स कूट कूट कर भरे मिलेंगे मूवी की दूसरी सबसे अच्छी बात है कि डिटेलिंग उस वर्ल्ड बिल्डअप के अंदर किस तरह से पानी की कमी है कि एक एक आंखों में से भी आंसू आ जाए ना तो वो भी पकड़ के पी लेते हैं दूसरी और टेक्नोलॉजी ऐसी है अगर कोई मर जाए तो उसमें से पानी निचोड़ के निकाल लिया जाता है वहां का रिलीजियन कैसे इंसान एक दूसरे को भगवान बनाना शुरू कर देते हैं और ये सारी जो रिलीजन वाली चीजें हैं वो आपके लाइफ में भी रिलेट होती हैं तो उस वक्त फील होता है कि स्क्रीन प्ले डायरेक्शन कितना स्मार्ट खेल रहे हैं भाई पानी वाला सीन हमने कल की टू एट नाइन एटी के टीजर में भी देखा जिसमें लोग बूंद बूंद को तरस रहे हैं इन शॉर्ट मूवी के अंदर ऐसे ऐसे वाइड एंगल सीन्स हैं, ऐसे ऐसे एक्शन सीन्स हैं जो आपकी आंखों को सुकून देंगे अब एक्शन की बात कर रहे हैं तो कुछ एक्शन सीक्वेंस बहुत ही बढ़िया है लाजवाब है लेकिन ऑडियंस एक्सपेक्ट कर रही थी कि एंड में आते आते बाहुबली कंक्लूजन में कैसे एपिक बैटल सीन होता है लेकिन सच बताऊं तो वो एक्सपेक्टेशन उस लेवल पर पहुंची नहीं अब इसे आप कह सकते हैं मजा नहीं आया लेकिन ऐसा ये जनरली डायरेक्टर करते नहीं है क्योंकि डायरेक्टर की दूसरी मूवीज ब्लेड रनर देखोगे तो उसका एंड पीक पर हुआ था पर वो मजा ड्यून पार्ट टू में नहीं आया मतलब ऐसा था कि एकदम पीक पर गया और फिर ऊपर से नीचे ड्रॉप कर दिया जैसे कुछ बॉलीवुड स्टार्स का करियर इसके अलावा अगर बात करें मूवी के बीजेम की तो आपको इंटरस्टेलर का बीजेम पसंद आया तो उसके जैसा ही इस फिल्म में फील होता है बीजेम वाइब्रेशन फील देता है उसके पीछे द लेजेंड हान सिमर का हाथ है मतलब मूवी कानों से आंखों से इस तरह से आपके दिमाग में घुस जाती है ऐसा फील होगा कि आप खुद ड्यून की दुनिया में पहुंच गए हैं ये है बीजीएम का जादू लोगों को एनिमल का बीजीएम अच्छा लगा था ये उससे सौ गुना अच्छा है अब किस लेवल का होगा सोच लो अब मूवी के अंदर एक कैरेक्टर है जिसके बारे में बहुत ज्यादा चर्चा हो रही थी कुछ अर्ली रिव्यूज में ये सुनने को मिला था कि इसमें हीथ लेजर लेवल की एक्टिंग देखने को मिली है और जोकर का लेवल का विलन है तो भाई बंदे की आईब्रोज पूरी निकाल दी गई है मतलब लिटरली टकला है और एकदम खूंखार दिखता है दिखने में खतरनाक है लेकिन वो भी सेकंड हाफ में बहुत लेट आता है इतना कुछ उसका स्क्रीन टाइम नहीं है लेकिन हीथ लेजर के जोकर वाली परफॉर्मेंस के लेवल के आसपास भी नहीं है तो अगर आप मूवी देखने जाओ तो एक्सपीरियंस के लिए जाना और ह्यूमंस और टेक्नोलॉजी मिलकर क्या कर सकते हैं कैसे बना ड्यून का यूनिवर्स इसके बारे में हम आपको बताते रहेंगे तब तक के लिए देखते रहिए हमारा चैनल बॉलीग्राथ स्टूडियो With Dune Part Two currently reigning over the theaters, here we have brought some untold truths of Dune. Dune, Dune is one of the most important, influential, and popular franchises in the history of science fiction. Beginning as a novel in 1965 by Frank Herbert, the Dune universe spans multiple volumes of books, short stories, comics, games, a TV miniseries, and a pair of film adaptations, released decades apart. At its heart it's a deep space saga set thousands of years into future in which multiple powerful entities fight to gain control of Arrakis a desert planet home to the powerful super power giving spice called Melange here's a look into the vast world of dune watch out for shy hulud or you know sandworms so guys where did the inspiration come from the original dune novel was inspired by the oregon dunes between the coastal town of florence oregon and the pacific ocean are the oregon dunes massive sand hills that in the 1950s the us department of agriculture discovered were actually moving they attempted to use certain breeds of grasses to stabilize and calm the dunes before they could continue to grow move and swallow whole cities lakes rivers and highways as frank herbert's letter to his literary agent breathlessly suggested they eventually could having published a few successful science fiction novels already herbert traveled to florence in 1957 to explore this bizarre scientific phenomenon and to write an article that piece was never completed but the concepts of precious natural resources and monstrous sand dunes and what may lay within led to dune After five years of research and writing, Herbert published 
Dune world and the prophet of Dune in serial form in the magazine analog science fiction magazine from 1963 to 1965. The author then compiled it into a single volume novel, Dune, which was published by technical book publisher Shilton Books in August 1965, after more than 20 other publishers rejected it. The current eye-catchy movie scenes that you are seeing in theatres have their own journey to reach till your eyes. Let's know that as well. It took a long time to make it to the movie theatre. Dune was published in 1965, but it didn't hit the big screen until 1984. For almost that entire span of 20 years, efforts were underway to adapt the book. In 1971, Abjack International, best known for the planet of apes. This production company acquired the movie rights and offered the director's chair to David Lean, the legendary British filmmaker behind another desert-based movie, Lawrence of Arabia. Lean passed as did British director Charles Jarrett. Any of the Thousand Years directed by was him. While a director was sought out, screenwriters worked on the script and production plans were put into place. But it all fell apart when Abjack head Arthur P. Jacobs died in 1973. Abjack sold the rights to Dune to a group of French investors who hired Event Garde film and theatrical director Eljandro Jodrowski as director. While he'd only directed three full-length films at the point, he definitely had the enthusiasm and ambition necessary to direct Dune. And then some. As detailed in fascinating 2013 documentary, Jodowski's Dune, the director planned to make a 14-hour movie with a dream cast including Orson Welles, Mike Jagger and Salvador Dali, with a soundtrack provided by Pink Floyd. To nail down the production design, Jordwaski consulted such innovative artists as Mobius and H.R. Giger. He also wanted to depict Melange the Spice as a magical blue sponge and completely change the ending of the novel. When that project died, the rights were sold to producer Dino De Laurentiis, who hired Ridley Scott to direct. He dropped out because, as he relates in Ridley Scott, the making of his movies, he was ready to film the movie immediately, but it was going to take at least two and a half more years of pre-production. Also, his heart wasn't in it, because his older brother Frank unexpectedly died of cancer while he was working on Dune. Ultimately, the gig went to cult movie icon, Eraserhead Blue Velvet David Lynch. The first Dune film was one of the biggest and most disastrous productions in history. Dune finally started being committed to film in 1983 and Shurubusko Studios in Mexico City. That location was chosen in part because it was adjacent to large swaths of desert that could stand in for the planet Arrakis. And because the Mexican economy was such that it would cost Universal Pictures far less to shoot the movie than it would have cost in the US. In Europe, there was no country with enough stage space and a desert. Producer Raffaele da Di Laurentiis told the New York Times, in Hollywood, stage rental alone would have cost $20 million shooting in LA. The producer estimates could have bumped the Dune price tag to $75 million. It ultimately cost about $40 million. And filmmakers made sure that every penny counted. To create the intricate worlds of Frank Herbert's novel, one of the biggest film crews of all time was assembled. 900 workers toiled for months to build 70 sets on 8 sound stages. More than 200 people alone had to clean 3 square miles of desert, down on their hands and knees, no less of scorpions, snakes and cactuses to replicate the lifeless surface of Arrakis. The cons of shooting remotely, the studios were infested by cockroaches, regular telephone outages, electricity so spotty that backup generators had to be ready to go at a moment's notice and a food poisoning epidemic afflicted half the crew at one point. Filming at one location had to be suddenly moved when it was discovered that the ancient volcano bed was actually where locals dumped their dead beds. The 1984 Dune film was a disaster. Universal hoped Dune would be the next Star Wars, but while it was certainly a disaster, critics absolutely hated it. Roger Elbert said Dune was a real mess, an incomprehensible, ugly, unstructured, pointless excursion into the murkier realms of one of the most confusing screenplays of all time. 
it lacked the broad appeal and fun of a more popular sci-fi like Star Wars and the Universal knew it on some level before the movie was released. Distributing hundreds of thousands of vocabulary guides to movie theatres in order to familiarise audiences with the dense world of Dune settings, characters and words. Unfortunately, the guides didn't help much. It ultimately earned just $30 million and the box office not even clearing its $40 million budget. As a result, Frank Herbert's other and other Dune books were never adapted for big screen. Because Dune was a big budget space set epic sci-fi movie, a ton of merchandise flooded stores in 1984. After all, Star Wars had done it not too long before and it earned the franchise millions. However, a lot of that merchandise appealed to kids because Star Wars was a movie with plenty of kids to enjoy. Dune, on the other hand, was decidedly not a kid-friendly movie. It was hardcore science fiction for serious fans only. And moreover, it earned a restrictive PG-13 rating from the MPAA. It seems like a bit of Photoshop trickery, but there's a ton of Dune stuff gathering dust in basements, garages and forgotten warehouses that kids didn't want or even knew existed. Various manufacturers paid big bucks for the rights to make Dune merchandise such as jigsaw puzzles, paper doll sets, a pop-up book, puffy stickers, bed sheets, party favors and Viewmaster slides, which came unpackaged with a special edition Dune themed viewing device. Among the strangest Dune products was a series of coloring books which invited kids to add zest to jarring images from the film such as skin lesion covered Baron Harkonnen and the prone poisoned bodies of Duke Leto Atreides and Peter de Vries. And in 1980s when action figures were big business, Dune dolls flopped. LJN Toys released toys in the likeliness of Paul Atreides, Baron Harkonnen, Fade, Rabam, Stilgar and Sardkor Warrior plus a sandworm while promised figures of Garne Haldak and Lady Jessica never hit stories. It inspired a lot of music though. Dune and its sequels make for a thoughtful, sprawling, imaginative sci-fi epic and the books were popular in the 60s and 70s, which can mean only one thing, it inspired a lot of progressive rock. In 1977, jazz keyboard David Matthews released Dune, inspired by the books. In 1979, experimental German electronic music composer Klaus Schluss released Dune, an album of the music inspired by the novel. That same year, French electronica pioneer Bernard Schnaznar released a Dune-themed album called Visions of Dune. Around the time of the film's release, Iron Maiden included the song to tame a land on its 1983 album, Peace of Mind. Having changed the song from its original title of Dune because Herbert wouldn't give permission. In 1999, German metal band Golem released the Dune themed concept album, The Second Moon, while two other metal bands have named themselves after the Dune verse, Shai Hulud and Dune. There are other versions of the movie as well. Lynch estimated that his shooting script would translate to a running time of about three hours. But once it was filmed, edited and effects were added in Dune, wound up being well over four, rightfully seeing that as completely unmarketable. Universal ordered Lynch to cut a bunch of scenes and streamline the plot because all of that unused footage, rumors have persisted for more than 30 years that there's a special Lynch curated director's cut. There isn't. Universal has approached by Lynch, but his displeasure and disappointment in the film has kept him from returning to cobble together another version. There is, however, a three-hour version of Dune with extra scenes added in. Assembled without Lynch's involvement for television broadcast, Lynch was so upset that he demanded his name taken off the credits for this version. Replaced with the standard Alan Smith pseudonym for director and fake name Judas Booth for screenwriter because Universal betrayed him like Judas did to Jesus and killed the movie like John Wilkes Booth did to Abraham Lincoln. David Lynch regrets directing the 1984 Dune. In a career filled with weird challenging movies, Blue Velvet, The Elephant Man, Eraser Hood and Zero Bonad Fidi, box office hits Dune is about the only project that writer-director David Lynch says he truly wishes he hadn't made. In fact, he says it even soiled him as an artist. I sold out so it was a slow dying the death and a terrible, terrible experience. He later reflected in his words. I don't know how it happened. I trusted that it would work out, but it was very naive. 
The wrong move in those days, the maximum length they figured I could have is 2 hours and 17 minutes and that's what the film is, so they wouldn't lose a screening day. It's money talking and not for the film at all and so it was like compacted and it hurt it, it hurt it. Lynch later told extrovert that he only has himself to blame. I probably shouldn't have done that picture, but I saw tons and tons of possibilities for things I loved and this was the structure to do them in. There was so much room to create a world. There were some reboots and some failed reboots. Regardless of the film's lackluster performance, the Dune franchise continued to gather more fans with each passing year. The franchise itself also grew with a well-received miniseries airing on the Sci-Fi Channel in 2003 and Herbert's son Brian Herbert writing more best-selling Dune sequel and prequel novels with Kevin J. Anderson by 2008 Hollywood once again saw Dune as a hot property with a lot of commercial potential. Paramount announced plans for a new version of the first novel and hired Peter Berg, who directed Hancock Battleship to direct. A year later, Berg dropped out and Pierre Morrill, who directed Taken, replaced him. But the studio called the whole thing off in March 2011. Once again, Dune refused to die. In 2016, Legendary Entertainment restarted the project again. Dallas Winnewew, the Oscar-nominated director for Arrival and Blade Runner 2049, signed on to direct a new adaption of Frank Herbert's original novel from 1965. With a budget reportedly around $200 million, it ranks among the most expensive undertakings in Hollywood history. And that's just the beginning as the project was planned from start to be split into two movies. Dennis की Dune Part 2 एक fairly faithful adaptation है Frank Herbert की Dune book का लेकिन फिर भी movie adaptation में काफी सारे notable changes किए गए हैं साथ ही जब 2021 में Dune का Part 1 आया था और उसमें भी Dune book के काफी सारे scenes गायब थे तब readers community थोड़ी हरी हो गई थी और तब director ने उनसे ये वादा किया था कि Dune के second part को novel से काफी close बनाया जाएगा लेकिन फिर भी 2024 में आई ड्यून 2 में उन्होंने फिर से काफी चेंजेस किए हैं लेकिन इसका मतलब ये नहीं है कि नॉर्मल और मूवी की स्टोरी और कैरेक्टर्स ही बदल दिए गए हैं इन फैक्ट डायरेक्टर ने ड्यून नॉवेल की स्टोरी और कैरेक्टर्स को मूवी एडाप्शन में पूरा का पूरा जस्टिस दिया है और यही मूवी की खासियत बनी है लेकिन फिर भी काफी सारे चेंजेस नजर आ रहे हैं और उनमें से जो काफी इंपॉर्टेंट और बड़े चेंजेस हैं वो हम आपको बताने जा रहे हैं जिनमें सबसे पहले चेंज है बुक में जो टाइम जंप दिखाया गया है उसे रिमूव करना इसका मतलब यह है कि मूवी की टाइमलाइन पार्ट 1 की एंडिंग के डायरेक्टली बाद से शुरू हो जाती है और सिर्फ कुछ ही मंथ्स का लीप आता है जिसमें जेसिका की प्रेगनेंसी की प्रोग्रेस दिखाई जाती है तो वहीं फ्रैंक हर्बर्ट ने ड्यू नॉवेल में पॉल के फ्रेम मैन का पार्ट बनने के बाद 2 सालों का टाइम जंप दिखाया है वैसे ही देखा जाए तो नॉवेल में दिखाया गया ये टाइम जम पॉल की प्रोग्रेस को स्लो कर देता है लेकिन मूवी में इसका पूरा नारेशन एक स्पीड के साथ जाता है इसलिए ये एक अच्छा चेंज माना जा सकता है उसके बाद पॉल का ड्यून पार्ट 1 के एंड में ड्रामस को मारना पार्ट 2 को भी इफेक्ट करता है लेकिन इस वजह से जो फॉल आउट हुआ और जिसे बुक में मेंशन किया गया था उसे मूवी में एक्सप्लोर ही नहीं किया गया है बुक के हिसाब से पॉल ड्रामस की वाइफ और उसके बच्चों की जिम्मेदारी लेने के लिए रिस्पांसिबल होता है और ड्रामस की वाइफ उसकी सर्वेंट बनती है और एक नए रिलेशनशिप की शुरुआत होती है लेकिन ड्यून टू मूवी में ड्रामस की वाइफ को कहीं भी मेंशन ही नहीं किया गया और ऐसा कह सकते हैं कि मूवी ने फ्रेम एंड कल्चर के इस पोर्शन को एक्सप्लोर ही नहीं किया इसके बाद एक और कैरेक्टर ड्यून टू से मिसिंग है जिसका नॉवेल में एक मेजर पार्ट है और वो है काउंट फेंड्रिंग जो हाउस कोरिनो का पार्ट है जिसे एक एसेसन बनने के लिए ट्रेन किया गया है और जो एम्पायर शडाम के एडवाइजर और क्लोज फ्रेंड है लेकिन ड्यून टू मूवी में उसकी वाइफ लेडी मार्गोट फेंड्रिंग को इंक्लूड किया गया है और ये एक बड़ा चेंज है कि क्योंकि बुक में एम्पायर काउंट फेंड्रिंग को पॉल को मारने का ऑर्डर देता है तो पॉसिबिलिटी है कि मूवी में ये काम लेडी मार्गोट फेंड्रिंग को दिया जाए साथ ही अब अगर ड्यून टू में हुए सबसे बड़े चेंज की बात की जाए तो वो है 
आलिया का रोल जिसे ड्यून टू में नॉवल से काफी अलग दिखाया गया है जहां नॉवल में पॉल की सिस्टर आलिया दो साल की छोटी बच्ची है जिसकी मेंटल कैपेसिटी एक एटल से भी ज्यादा है उसे पूरी मूवी में जेसिका के वोम में ही दिखाया गया है लेकिन इस रोल के लिए आनिया टेलर ड्रॉय को कास्ट किया गया है जिसका मतलब ये है कि आलिया एक छोटा सा रोल अभी भी मूवी में कर रही है और वो है वो अपनी माँ जेसिका से सब कॉन्शियसली बात कर रही है अब इस चेंज को करने के पीछे की वजह के बारे में बात की जाए तो आलिया एक डिफिकल्ट कैरेक्टर है जिसे लाइव एक्शन मूवी में अडाप्ट करना काफ़ी मुश्किल हो सकता है इसलिए ये चेंज ज़रूरी था लेकिन इसका मतलब ये भी है कि ड्यून टू में इस चेंज की वजह से कुछ और चेंजेस भी करने पड़ेंगे इसके साथ ही पॉल और शैनी का रोमांस ड्यून टू का एक मेजर पार्ट है लेकिन मूवी में उनके फर्स्ट ट्रायल के डेवलपमेंट को नहीं दिखाया गया है अब इसके पीछे की वजह की बात की जाए तो वो है ड्यून मूवी में दिखाई गई कॉम्प्रेस्ड टाइमलाइन और डायरेक्टर डेनिस ने जिसम तरह से छानी के लसान अल गैब प्रोफेसी पर प्रस्पेक्टिव को बदला है वही है लेकिन नॉवल में छानी पॉल के फर्स्ट बेबी लेटो टू को जन्म देती है और वो एक साल दो सालों तक रहते हैं लेकिन जब फ्रेमैन पर हमला होता है तो इस ट्रेजिडी में पॉल का पहला बच्चा मर जाता है और इस पूरे पार्ट को मूवी में मेंशन ही नहीं किया गया है साथ ही इस पर से ही एक बड़ा और चीन सामने आता है जिसे बुक से पूरा बदल दिया है और वो है चैनी का लसान एल गैप प्रोफेसी का हिस्सा बनाना मूवी में चैनी का जो फ्रेमैन नेम है सिहाया जिसका मतलब होता है डिजर्ट स्प्रिंग उसे पूरी तरह से इनकॉर्पोरेट किया गया और इस कैरेक्टर को और ज्यादा वॉल्यूबल बनाया गया है पहले भी ये मेंशन किया गया था कि ट्रेनी का कनेक्शन किसी प्रोफेसी के साथ है और जब पॉल वाटर ऑफ लाइफ पीता है तब उसका कनेक्शन रिवील होता है जब पॉल कोमा में होता है और उस वक्त जब ट्रेनी रोती है तो उसके आंसू में वाटर ऑफ लाइफ के पार्ट्स होते हैं जो पॉल पर पड़ते हैं वो उड़ जाता है और ये पूरा इवेंट इस प्रोफेसी का हिस्सा है जबकि नॉवल में ऐसा कुछ मैंशन ही नहीं किया गया है इसके साथ ही ड्यून टू की एंडिंग में भी काफ़ी नोटेबल चेंजेस किए गए हैं जो एक और कैरेक्टर की डेथ बताती है और वो है बैरॉन मूवी में पॉल अपने ग्रैंडफादर को हाउस हेरकॉन और एम्पर के बीच हुई मीटिंग्स के बाद मार देता है और ये हिस्सा नॉवल से काफी अलग है क्योंकि बुक में आलिया बैरॉन हेरकॉन को मारने के लिए रिस्पॉन्सिबल है लेकिन मूवी में पॉल का अपने ग्रैंड को मारना और उन्हें डिजर्ट में ही छोड़ देना एक डिसरिस्पेक्टफुल आर्ट की तरह बताया गया खैर अब आप बताओ आपने देखी मूवी की नहीं हम फिर मिलेंगे बबाय जहाँ पे ड्यून के पहले पार्ट ने छोड़ा हमें क्लिफ हैंगर पर और हमें ड्यूक पॉल यानी तेमोथी और उनकी माँ जेसिका यानी रेबिका की फ्यूचर की चिंता होने लगती है और जब उनकी मुलाकात होती है फ्रीमैन लीडर यानी जेवियर बाडम के साथ और पॉल को छैनी यानी जिंदाया का भी अब सिर्फ भ्रम नहीं हो रहा है क्योंकि वो उसे फ्लैश एंड ब्लड में यानी एक ह्यूमन की तरह खड़ा देखता है इसलिए जिसने भी ये प्रिडिक्ट किया था कि श्रेणी का कैरेक्टर सिर्फ पॉल की इमेजिनेशन नहीं बल्कि सच में एक इंसान है जो उसे फ्यूचर में बुला रही है उनकी थ्योरी आज सही साबित हुई सो कॉन्ग्रेचुलेशन एंड सेलिब्रेशन क्या इसके साथ ही अगर आपने ड्यून का पहला पार्ट अब तक नहीं देखा है तो ये सही वक्त है कि आप उसे देखें फिर जब आप दूसरे हिस्से को देखने के लिए सीट पर बैठेंगे और इस मूवी के वी एफ एक्स और सी जी आई के साथ देखेंगे तब आपको समझ आएगा कि ड्यून एक यंग मैन की कमिंग ऑफ एज स्टोरी है जिसकी पूरी लाइफ डस्ट में बदल जाती है और फिर बेचारा जिससे प्यार करता है ये सोचकर कि उसकी पूरी जिंदगी बदल जाएगी जो तो बदलती भी है लेकिन फूलों की जगह काटे बिछे हुए होते हैं इसके साथ ही ड्यून पार्ट वन ने आपको ये सोचने पर मजबूर किया होगा कि क्या पॉल एक मज़ाया है और अब इस फॉलो मूवी में ये सवाल और भी कॉम्प्लेक्स हो जाता है और जब हम कई सारे नए कैरेक्टर से मिलते हैं और उनके ट्राइब्स और क्लान्स की कल्चर एंड हिस्ट्री के बारे में जानते हैं इसके साथ ही थे मोदी और जिंदाया के फैंस जिन्हें फर्स्ट पार्ट को लेकर ये लगता था कि उनके साथ चीटिंग हुई है उनको एक बार शिकायत करने का मौका भी नहीं मिलेगा क्योंकि उनकी केमिस्ट्री ड्यून टू की आज बैन और शान है लिखे गए सीन्स और डायलॉग्स इतने रियल हैं कि एक भी बल के लिए एक भी चीज़ या नकली नहीं लगता है डायलॉग्स इन दोनों के अलावा मूवी के दो बड़े सितारे हैं 
हांस जेमर का म्यूजिक स्कोर और ग्रीक फ्रेजर की सिनेमेटोग्राफी जो दोनों अगले साल ऑस्कर ले जाने के लिए लायक है ड्यून टू के वाइट शॉर्ट और क्लोज अप इतनी इंस्पायरिंग है कि आपको वो उसी दुनिया में ले जाते हैं और स्टोरी इतनी इमोशनल है कि कोई भी सख्त बंदा पिघल जाएगा साथ ही हम ये कह सकते हैं कि ड्यून टू तिमोदी और जिंदाया के फैंस के लिए वही खुशी लाने वाला है जो पीटर जैक्सन ने लॉर्ड ऑफ द रिंग्स ट्राइलॉजी के साथ लाया था साथ ही जो लोग ये कहते हैं कि एक सीक्वल और फॉलो अप वाली फिल्में काफ़ी रिस्की होती हैं और अक्सर स्टूडियोज़ को लॉसेस सहने पड़ते हैं उनके लिए ड्यून पार्ट टू एक बड़ा एग्जाम्पल सेट करती है जो अपने लगभग दो और आधे घंटे के रन टाइम के बावजूद ये साबित करता है कि कभी कभी बड़ा होना भी बेहतर हो सकता है इसके साथ ही जब ड्यून पार्ट वन साल 2021 में आई थी तब किसी ने प्रडिक्ट नहीं किया होगा कि साल 2024 आने तक फैंस इसके पार्ट टू का इतना बेसब्री से इंतजार करने वाले हैं ऐसा कहा जा सकता है कि ड्यून एक कल्ट फेवरेट मूवी बन चुकी है जो एक सही मूड के लिए बनाई गई है और इसकी स्टोरी म्यूजिक कैरेक्टर्स व्यूजल्स हमें डेजर्ट लार्डन फिल्म में अलादीन की मैट्रिक आपत में बिठाकर ड्यून के एडवेंचर भरी दुनिया में ले जाती है इसके साथ ही इस मूवी की कास्ट में भी ग्लोबल सुपरस्टार जिंदाया ते मौथी और जोश ब्रोलन के नाम शामिल हैं और यहाँ तक कि ग्रीक गॉड मेन जेन वाले ते मौथी की वर्ल्ड वाइड फैन फॉलोइंग काफ़ी ज़्यादा है और साथ ही उनकी हाल ही में आई विली वोंका भी काफ़ी सक्सेसफुल रही और जिंदाया तो जब से नीता अंबानी की इंडियन मेड गाला में आई तब से हम इंडियंस का दिल जीत ही चुकी हैं खैर बाबा तो आपने देखी मूवी की नहीं हम फिर मिलेंगे बाय बाय फिल्म ड्यून पार्ट वन ये साल 2021 में रिलीज हुई एक साइंस फिक्शन मूवी है ये मूवी स्टार वॉर गेम ऑफ थ्रोन्स कई एलियन फ्रेंचाइजी या हॉलीवुड की कई सारी फिल्मों को इंस्पायर भी कर चुकी है इससे हम मूवी का पोटेंशियल भी समझ सकते हैं तो ये कहानी है ड्यून नाम के एक रेगिस्तानी प्लानट की ये तकरीबन 8000 साल बाद की फ्यूचर की कहानी है जहाँ प्लैनेट्स पर राज घराने राज करते हैं जहाँ एक एम्पायर है जो तीन हाउसेस पर नजर रखता है उसमें से अराकिस एक पावरफुल हाउस है जहाँ स्पाइस जैसा एक सब्सटेंस होता है सिंपल भाषा में एक मसाला जिसकी वजह से एक इंसान सुपर पावरफुल बन सकता है और उसकी आँखें नीली हो जाती हैं पर अगर इसका ज़्यादा इस्तेमाल हो तो वो इंसान एडिक्ट भी बन सकता है जैसे एक ड्रग एडिक्ट होता है वैसे एक फ्यूल की तरह भी इसे इस्तेमाल किया जाता है जैसे धरती पर हमें डीजल पेट्रोल की ज़रूरत होती है वैसे एक प्लानट से दूसरे प्लानट पर जाने के लिए इसकी बहुत ही ज़्यादा ज़रूरत होती है वैसे ये मूवी अमेरिकन राइटर फ्रैंक हर्बर्ट की नाइनटीन में लिखी गई एक नॉवल पर बेस्ड मूवी है जिसका नाम भी ड्यून ही है और इस बुक के फर्स्ट हाफ पर मूवी का पहला पार्ट बना तो सेकंड हाफ पर सेकंड पार्ट बना इस मूवी में पॉल नाम का एक यंग बॉय है जिसका परिवार अराकिस प्लैनेट का मैनेजमेंट एक्सेप्ट करता है अराकिस इन एक्सेसिबल और एक रेगिस्तानी बंजर जमीन है जहां मिलने वाला स्पाइस मेंटल एबिलिटीज को बढ़ाता है स्पाइस स्पेस नेविगेशन के लिए भी जरूरी है ये देखते हुए कि स्पाइस सिर्फ अराकिस पर प्रोड्यूस होता है प्लैनेट पर कंट्रोल खतरनाक लेकिन डिजायरेबल होता है तो इसमें साइंस फिक्शन एलिमेंट के साथ साथ पॉलिटिक्स भी मौजूद है वैसे जिस बुक पर ये फिल्म बेस्ड है उसमें और इस मूवी में कुछ डिफरेंस जरूर है बुक में कई सारी फिक्शनल थीम्स कल्चर टेक्नोलॉजी को लेकर बातें की गई जो कि स्क्रीन पर विजुअलाइज करना थोड़ा चैलेंजिंग होता है इस मूवी के डायरेक्टर डेनिस की ड्यून पार्ट वन फैमिली को उनके होम प्लैनेट कैलेडन से अराकिस तक ले जाती है और वायलेंस और विश्वासघात से भागने के बाद पॉल और जेसिका को फ्री मैन के साथ अभ्यारण्य खोज के साथ एंड होता है और जबकि कुछ कैरेक्टर्स गायब है स्पेशली फेयर रोथा षडयंत्रकारी बैरन हरकोनैन का भतीजा और उत्तराधिकारी प्लॉट में मिनिमम चेंजेस है पर स्मॉल मोर इंटेंस इंटरेस्टिंग प्लॉट पॉइंट्स और कहानी के ह्यूज रेपिक स्केल दोनों पर फोकस करते हैं वैसे नोवेल में हर्बर्ट हमें एक कैरेक्टर से दूसरे कैरेक्टर की ओर ले जाते हैं हम देखते हैं कि वे कौन है वो किससे प्यार करते हैं और किससे नफरत करते हैं और क्या चीज़ उन्हें प्रभावित करती है पर मूवी में विद ह्यूज कास्ट और इतनी बड़ी कहानी के साथ ये समझ में आता है कि कैरेक्टर्स के बीच रिलेशनशिप की डेप्थ साथ ही इंडिविजुअल कैरेक्टर डेवलपमेंट शायद उतनी एक्सटेंसिव नहीं हो सकती जितनी उस नॉवल में है हवर्ट के ड्यून से 
डायरेक्टर के बड़े चेंजेस में से एक पॉल का स्पाइस के प्रति एक्सपोजर है जबकि नॉवल के पॉल को स्पाइस के कांटेक्ट में आने और अपने विचर और अपनी पावर्स पर इसके इफेक्ट का एक्सपीरियंस करने में ज्यादा टाइम लगता है पर मूवी के पॉल को लगभग तुरंत ही हाइपर सेंसिटिव दिखाया गया है एक रेस्क्यू ऑपरेशन के दौरान वो हेलुसिनेशन का शिकार हो जाता है और बाद में टेंट की हवा में मसाले से प्रभावित होता है ये बदलाव असल में बड़े पर्दे के लिए बहुत मायने रखता है मूवी में हमें बेने गैसरिट थूफिर हावत गुरनी हेलेक पीटर डेव शेड आउट मैप्स डॉक्टर यू और स्टिगलो की सिर्फ ग्लिम्स यानी झलक मिलती है जो सभी ड्यून के प्लॉट के लिए ज़रूरी है बहुत ज़्यादा डेवलप्ड है नॉवल में जैसन मोमोआ के डंकन इदाहो को ज़्यादा स्क्रीन टाइम मिलता है जबकि जिंदाया की चाइनी प्राइमली ड्रीमी विटन में दिखाई जाती है और वॉइस ओवर नारेशन में वर्ल्ड बिल्डिंग या पोलिटिकल कॉन्टेक्सट के डिफरेंट इम्पॉर्टेंट पीसेस को समझती है ड्यून टू अब बात करते हैं ड्यून के सेकेंड पार्ट की जो रिलीज हो चुका है फर्स्ट मार्च 2024 को और फ्रैंक हावर्ट के नॉवल को मूवी के डायरेक्टर ने इस बार भी अच्छी तरह से डिस्क्राइब करने की कोशिश की है डायरेक्टर ने एक बार फिर नॉवल के सेकेंड हाफ को बारीकी से प्रेजेंट करने का काम तो किया है पर ड्यून टू ने एक से ज्यादा ओकेजन पर नॉवल को बदल दिया है मतलब कुछ बदलाव है इस मूवी में चाहे वो कहानी से पूरे कैरेक्टर का मिसिंग होना हो या कहानी के बाकी डिटेल्स में डिफरेंसेज हो अब मूवी ड्यून टू में ड्यून टाइमलाइन बदल जाती है क्योंकि डेनिस की अगली कड़ी किताब में होने वाली टाइम जम को हटा देती है ये मूवी ड्यून के खत्म होने के इवेंट्स के ठीक बात की है और जैसिका की प्रेगनेंसी कैसे आगे बढ़ती है इस पर डिपेंड करते हुए मूवी के दौरान केवल कुछ महीने ही गुजरते हैं ये नॉवल से डिफरेंट है क्योंकि पॉल के फ्री मैन का हिस्सा बनने के तुरंत बाद फ्रैंक ने दो साल बाद टाइम जम्प इम्प्लीमेंट किया था ये डिफरेंट रिलेशनशिप्स को डेवलप होने के अलाउ करता है और पॉल के पावर में आने की स्पीड को स्लो कर देता है ड्यून टू टाइम जम्प को हटाकर पूरी स्टोरी को स्पीड देता है वैसे ड्यून टू से मिसिंग एक कैरेक्टर है जिसका नॉवल में प्रोमिनेंट रोल था वो है काउंट फेंड्रिंग ये हाउस कोरिनो का हिस्सा है जो ट्रेंड हथियारे और एडवाइजर को सम्राट शदाम का रिश्तेदार करीबी दोस्त और सलाहकार बनाता है जबकि ड्यून टू में उनकी पत्नी लेडी मॉर्गेट फेंड्रिंग शामिल है लेकिन वो कहीं भी नहीं मिली पर नॉवल में एम्पेर फेंड्रिंग को पॉल को मारने का ऑर्डर देता है वैसे ड्यून टू नॉवल की टाइमलाइन को छोटा कर देता है इससे होल स्टोरी में और भी बड़े चेंजेस आते हैं अब इस मूवी में पॉल की बहन आलिया का जन्म नहीं हुआ है पर नॉवल में आलिया का जन्म उस वक्त हुआ जब पॉल और जेसिका फ्रीमैन के साथ गहरे रेगिस्तान में रह रहे थे खैर आपने ये मूवी देखी कि नहीं बताया मैं कॉमेंट सेक्शन में फिर मिलेंगे बाय ड्यून ऑन द मून अनफॉर्चूनेटली द कॉम्प्लिकेटेड एंड कॉम्प्लेक्स प्लैनेटरी सिस्टम्स ऑफ ड्यून आर नॉट रियल एंड अनफॉर्चूनेटली देयर इज नो लैंड ऑन टाइटन द मून ऑफ सैटर्न नेवरदेलेस इट्स ऑन टाइटन दैट ड्यून हैज बिकम रियल एज ऑफ 2009 द नेम्स ऑफ प्लैनेट्स फ्रॉम द नॉवेल्स आर व्हाट आर ऑफिशियली यूज्ड टू नेम प्लेन्स ऑन दैट मून फॉर एग्जांपल चिसुक प्लैनेशिया a bit closer to home apollo 15 astronauts who visited the earth's moon in 1971 identified and spotted a crater the name dune dune is among the first sci-fi award winners after years of research and writing frank herbert completed two short science fiction novels dune world and the prophet of dune that were published in serialized form in analog science fact and fiction one of the major outlets for genre stories in the mid 20th century at the time short stories dominated sci-fi because according to the guardian that's what publishers thought readers wanted that's probably a big reason why dune was rejected by more than 20 publishers before it found a champion in shit dune proved that there was a market not just for long form science fiction By the way it ran well over 400 pages in its first hardback edition in 1965 but high end science fiction with literary merit Dune is one of the first modern day sci-fi epics and was justly rewarded capturing the inaugural Nebula Award for best novel Consumers responded in a big way to Dune and its descendants It's still a consistent seller and is one of the most purchased sci-fi books in history while sequel Children of Dune went down as the first novel in the genre to become a best seller in hardback Frank Herbert wrote an alternate early Dune novel Dune existed in several permutations before it finally became the lengthy novel published in 1965 author Frank Herbert carefully combined 
two smaller serialized novels dune world and the prophet of dune into one although that all strayed from his first foray into the world of interstellar spirituality and sand bombs a project he called spice planet while sifting through the mountains of documents and notes herbert left behind after his death in 1986 his son brian herbert and his writing partner kevin j anderson discovered an outline scene descriptions and character notes for this never published alternate iteration of the original dune in 2005 In 2005 Brian Herbert and Anderson who have kept the Dune literary franchise alive with various books and stories used Frank Herbert's guide and composed a complete manuscript for Spice Planet along with original short stories written by the duo the novella was published in the Dune Epiphema collection The Road to Dune reading like both a prequel and offshoot of Frank Herbert's Dune Spice Planet includes familiar character names and locations and involves the pursuit of a powerful substance called spice but otherwise consists of a long ago abandoned plot threads lots of major actors didn't get cast in dune pre production on the 1984 dune including the months it took writer director david lynch to adapt frank herbert's novel into a screenplay took a very long time and filmmakers wanted to make sure they cast the perfect performers to portray the potentially lucrative franchise's already well known character Glenn Close turned down the role of Jessica believing that the character was a cliche of a helpless woman. Aldo Ray was actually cast as Gurney Halleck and reported to the set but was soon dismissed and replaced by Patrick Stewart. Kenneth Branagh auditioned for the lead role of Paul Atreides but lost to the newcomer Kyle MacLachlan. His future partner Helena Bonham Carter was also nearly a part of the Dune cast. She landed the role of Princess Irulan, but due to a scheduling conflict on a room with a view, she had to quit the sci-fi epic, leaving the door open for Virginia Madsen to take over. Did you know the belly set is a real instrument? Although Dune is set among sophisticated planets in the distant future, the entertainment option of its residents have a distinctively ancient and rustic sensibility. Gurney Halleck is a major figure in the life of Paul Atreides, a warrior, teacher and ally who loved to perform old minstrel style ballads to entertain guests and associates, all while accompanying himself on a long nine-stringed instrument called the belly set. Something of a cross between a guitar and a zither. It provided enough music to help Halleck emphasize his proverbs, scripture readings and lyrics. In the 1984 film version of Dune, Patrick Stewart plays Halleck and the belly set. It was mentioned by the name in Frank Herbert's original Dune novel, but filmmakers took a real, although obscure, earth instrument and painted it gold. The belly set is actually a Chapman stick, a fretboard based, elaborately strung, strummable wooden instrument invented by a musician Emmett Chapman. In 1985, Chapman released Parallel Galaxy, an album of Chapman's sick compositions which includes Backyard, heard in the Dune movie with Stewart miming playing to Chapman's recording. At the time that Dune was filmed in the early 1980s, Sean Young was one of the biggest new stars in Hollywood thanks to prominent roles in the hit comedy Stripes and the sci-fi classic Blade Runner. She signed on to play Shani Kynes, a fermen warrior in Dune, but she nearly missed out on the role. According to the making of Dune, Young's agency set up a meeting in New York City with director David Lynch and producer Rafaela De Laurentiis, but forgot to tell Young about it. On the day it was scheduled she hopped a flight to California to go meet about another film. Meanwhile Lynch and De Laurentiis missed their flight to the West Coast because they had been waiting around for No Show Young. The actor, the director and producer all wound up on the same plane and De Laurentiis asked a flight attendant if Young, whom she'd never met or seen, was an actor. She is, the worker reportedly said. Her name is Sean Young. De Laurentiis confronted Young telling her that the agency said she refused the audition which simply wasn't true. The trial cleared the air over drinks. I sit with her and David and we all started drinking champagne. De Laurentiis recalled, "By the time we arrived in LA, we were roaring drunk. Young got the part, of course." Jurgen Prochno was gravely injured on the set of Dune. For the role of House Atreides patriarch Duke Leto Atreides, Dune writer director David Lynch cast German actor Jürgen Prochno, the breakout star of the 1981 World War II submarine thriller Das Boot. 
According to the making of Dune, the last scene Pranshu had to film was a drug-induced nightmare sequence in which he lays unconscious on a stretcher, while the wicked Baron Harakonen crudely shoves his finger into a facial wound, expelling spooky green gas. To bring this concept to life, the Dune special effects team created a fake cheek out of rubber and makeup, stuck it to Pranshu's face and attached a tube that ran behind the actor's ear and onto the stretcher. Off camera, a tech would pump green smoke into the device that would plume out when Macmillan prodded it. The crew tested the effect on a dummy and Pranchno before cameras rolled. When it came time to film, Macmillan did what he was supposed to do, sticking his fingers into the wound and then smoke came out. Something had gone wrong. However, because Pranchno ran off the set clutching his face. An investigation revealed that the device had malfunctioned, it hadn't been properly sealed and hot smoke from a test had built up inside the fake cheek before McCamellan tore it open, resulting in near molten goo spilling onto Pranchnow's face. He suffered first and second degree burns in the accident. David Lynch's Dune was supposed to be a trilogy. Dune was obviously supposed to be a franchise starter, a new blockbuster series to rival other sci-fi brands like Star Wars and Star Trek. Its success was so assured that before the film's theatrical release in 1984, star Kyle MacLachlan signed a contract to appear in four more films in the Dune cinematic universe. Even though his character Paul Atreides only figured into three more Dune source novels. Virginia Madsen, who landed the small role of Prince Zirulin, told the Kevin Pollack chat show that she'd signed a deal to reprise the role in two more films. They thought they were gonna make Star Wars for grown-ups, she said, and it didn't work out that way. When Dune was greeted with critical shrugs and less than huge numbers at the box office, a $30 million total run against a $40 million budget plans for more movies were cancelled. Dune, screenwriter director David Lynch was already deep into the screenplay for the next movie in the series based on Frank Herbert's Dune Masia, which was subsequently abandoned. Could the new Dune be the new Star Wars? Virginia Madsen, part of the cast of the 1984 film adaptation of Dune, claimed in an interview that filmmakers had attempted to make Star Wars for grown-ups. That's the exact same approach that director-writer Dennis Villeneuve took when he set out to bring Dune to the screen again, more than the three decades after that it ill-fated him. The ambition is to do the Star Wars movie I never saw, Billy Newby told Phantom. In a way, it's Star Wars for adults. Well, the interesting part is that Dune leads heavily on an older, obscure history text. Frank Herbert was chiefly inspired by the sand dunes of the Oregon coast, but according to the Los Angeles reviews of books, he also ran with elements laid out in a now obscure book published in 1960 called The Sabres of Paradise. Written by Leslie Blanche, an English author best known for travel writing and romance novels, it's a dense and epic exploration of the life of Imam Shami, who, united under the Islam faith, previously opposed groups in the North Caucasus regions of Asia and who led a two decades long resistance movement against imperialist Russian forces in the mid 19th century. Blanche Peppers, the work with words from Chekhovsa, a Caucasian language, and a few examples show up in Dune. Kankli, a term meaning blood feud, appears in Herbert's novels with the same definition, and Kinjal, a common weapon, is the name of a popular knife among the elite in Dune. When protagonist Paul Atreides takes up with the desert tribe whose ways are similar to that of Caucasus warrior groups, he resides at Siege Treber. Both words mean camp in the language of Russian forces on the other side. Herbert even took a whole line from the Sabres of Paradise. A fight trainer tells Paul Atreides to use style in his sword play as killing with the tip lacks artistry. In Blank's work, she wrote that Caucasians believed that to kill with the point lacked artistry. It's okay. I'm in love. Your blood comes from dukes. Then great houses. What we do, we do for the benefit of all. You are not prepared for what is to come.
अगर आपने ड्यून पार्ट वन देखी होगी तो उसमें आपको बेने गेस्ट्रूट के रोल के बारे में जरूर पता होगा जिसमें बेने गेस्ट्रूट की हजार साल तक चली स्किन का फल जो मेल सीवियर फिगर क्वीन जैट हैराज को ब्रीड करना था वो पॉल के रूप में उन्हें मिलता है लेकिन ट्विस्टेड बात यह है कि पॉल को क्वी जैट हैराज नहीं बनना था और उतना ही नहीं उसे तो पैदा ही नहीं होना था जी हाँ और उसके बाद रेवरेंड मदर के कहने पर जेसिका लियो यानी कि पॉल के पिता को वो बता देती है जिसकी वो काफी सालों से राह देख रहे थे लेकिन अगर वो बेटी होती तो एक पीढ़ी बाद क्वी जैट हैराज को जन्म देती और इसी वजह से बेने गेस्ट का प्लान बुरी तरह से फ्लॉप हो जाता है और साथ ही उन्हें पॉल के बारे में भी कुछ पता नहीं चल पाता है क्योंकि वो उसे रेस नहीं कर पाती है लेकिन फिर भी ये सरिस्टर लोग कभी कभी अपने बनाए गए मेसिहा के जीवन में हस्तक्षेप करने लगते हैं खास करके उनके सेल्फ कंट्रोल को साबित करने के लिए गोम जब्बर का प्रयोग किया जाता है और इसी से रेवरेंट मदर बैरन हरकोरिन भी इंप्रेस हो जाती है और पॉल और जेसिका की जान बचाने के लिए हाउस एडवाइस पर अपने अटैक से पहले उन्हें जाने देती है लेकिन फिर भी पॉल उन पर हमला कर देता है ये तो बात हो गई बेने गेसरीट के ड्यून पार्ट वन रोल की लेकिन ड्यून पार्ट टू में क्या है तो बिना स्पॉइलर दिए अगर बात की जाए तो बेने गेसरीट डायरेक्टली एंड इनडायरेक्टली इस सीक्वल की नरेटिव को हर तरह से अफेक्ट करती है ना सिर्फ पॉल के क्विजैट हैट्रेज बिजन्स उसके एक्शन और कैरेक्टर आर्क को गाइड करेंगे लेकिन साथ ही वो फ्रीमैन प्रोफेसी को भी इन्वेंट करने वाले हैं ताकि उनके ट्रूप की लॉयल्टी हमेशा उनके लिए बरकरार रहे साथ ही बेने गेस्ट प्रीवियसली अनसीन स्टूडेंट लेडी मार्गोट फेनरिंग को पॉल की नई नेमिस और ब्रीडी प्रोग्राम सब्जेक्ट फे रोथा हर कोरेंट पर नजर रखने के लिए भी भेजने वाली है इसके साथ ही हम क्रेडिट से पहले रेवरेंड मदर को भी स्पॉटलाइट देते हुए देखते हैं ड्यून टू में प्रिंसेस इरुलार कोरिनो का किरदार भी ना बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट है जिसे प्ले किया है फ्लोरेंस पुग ने जो कि एम्पर शदाम पोर कोरिनो की बेटी है उसे बेने गेसरीट के लिए बहुत ही अच्छे तरीके से ट्रेन किया गया है और अगर नॉवेल की बात की जाए तो वो रीडर्स को हिस्टोरिकल बैकग्राउंड और ऑफर्स परस्पेक्टिव नारेट करती है जो एक छोटा किरदार है लेकिन अगर इस किरदार को प्ले करने के लिए फ्लोरेंस पुक को कास्ट किया गया है तो फिर वो किरदार छोटा तो नहीं हो सकता है हम कह सकते हैं कि इस कैरेक्टर को एक्सपेंड किया गया है जी हाँ साथ ही अगर बेने गेस्ट प्रिंसेस इरुलान के पावर्स की बात की जाए तो उनके पास एक्सपेंडेड मेंटल कैपेसिटी एंड हाइटेंड सेंसेस है जो उनके परसेप्टिव एक नॉर्मल पर्सन से ज्यादा इंपॉर्टेंट बनाता है साथ ही वो अपनी बॉडी केमिस्ट्री को अपनी इच्छा के अनुसार ऑल्टर कर सकती है जो सिस्टरहुड में डेवलप की गई एक काफी इंप्रेसिव एबिलिटीज मानी जाती है साथ ही द बेने गेस्ट्री एक्सट्रीमली वेल एडुकेटेड होती है और प्रिंसेस इरुलान के पास हिस्ट्री की डीप नॉलेज होती है डीप अंडरस्टैंडिंग होती है साथ ही अगर बेने गेस्ट्री मेंबर्स के ऑर्डर की बात की जाए तो प्रिंसेस इरुलान को एक वीकर आडिशन माना जाता है लेकिन वो एक एवरेज इंसान से काफी ज्यादा इंटेलिजेंट है और एक डेडली स्पाई बनने के लिए कैपेबल है साथ ही अगर हम नॉवेल की बात करें तो फिर प्रिंसेस एरुलान का द वॉइस के साथ कोई कनेक्शन नहीं है लेकिन पॉसिबल है कि ड्यून टू उन्हें ये एबिलिटी भी प्रोवाइड करे क्योंकि उनके कैरेक्टर को एक्सपेक्ट किया जा रहा है साथ ही दोस्तों प्रिंसेस एरुलान एक हिस्टोरियन भी है और ड्यून के इवेंट्स को लेकर ना उन्होंने काफी नोटेबल काम किया है और नॉवेल के हिसाब से उन्होंने अपनी राइटिंग ड्यून मूवी की टाइमलाइन से पहले ही शुरू कर दी थी और इतना ही नहीं हर्बर्ट की ड्यून नॉवेल के काफी सारे चैप्टर्स को प्रिंसेस की जर्नल एंट्रीज के साथ इंट्रोड्यूस भी किया गया है जो काफी वैल्यूएबल मानी जाती है इसलिए हम ऐसा कह सकते हैं कि ड्यून टू में उनका रोल स्टोरी के कुछ हिस्सों का नरेशन करने का होगा या हम उन्हें कुछ इवेंट्स को रीड करते हुए भी देख सकते हैं जो नॉवल में मैंशन है साथ ही ड्यून के प्रिंसेस इरुलान अपनी राइटिंग्स के लिए इंफॉर्मेशन कलेक्ट करने के लिए वेल पोजिशन भी है और उनकी बेने गेस्ट्री ट्रेनिंग उन्हें एक एक्सपैंडेड मेंटल कैपेसिटी देती है जिसकी मदद से वो जो सुनती है उससे अच्छे से मेमोराइज कर सकती है इसके साथ ही प्रिंसेस इरुलान एम्पर शदामपुर की फाइव डॉटर्स में से सबसे बड़ी है और एम्पर की बेटा पाने के डिजायर की वजह से उनकी बेटियों की लाइफ काफी डिफिकल्ट हो गई थी लेकिन एम्पर की बड़ी बेटी होने की वजह से उनका बचपन अच्छा था और उन्हें पहले से ही अपने फादर के हियर की तरह ट्रीट किया गया था साथ ही इरुलान और उनके सिस्टर्स को एम्पेरियल कोर्ट की लेडीज बनने के लिए भी ट्रेन किया गया था जी हाँ और प्रिंसेस की इसी 
इंपॉर्टेंस की वजह से बेने के स्वीट ने उन्हें अपने इरादों के लिए ट्रेन किया साथ ही यहाँ पर ट्रस्ट वाली बात तो ये है दोस्तों की प्रिंसेस की मदर और एम्पर की वाइफ भी बेने के स्वीट की मेंबर थी और उन्हें सिर्फ बेटियां पैदा करने का ही ऑर्डर दिया गया था साथ ही हम ये कह सकते हैं कि प्रिंसेस इरुलान की लॉयल्टीज को ड्यून टू में टेस्ट किया जाने वाला है जिसमें उन्हें अपने पिता के प्रति अपना डिवोशन और बेने के स्वीट की तरफ से दी गई डिमांड इन दोनों को ही बैलेंस करना होगा और बेने के स्वीट के मेंबर होने की वजह से उन्हें जो भी हायर रैंकिंग मेंबर्स की तरफ से ऑर्डर मिलते हैं उन्हें उसे भी पूरा करना पड़ेगा और एम्पर के हाउस एंड राइडर्स के साथ चल रहे कॉन्फ्लिक्ट की वजह से एम्पायर की स्टेबिलिटी खतरे में आ जाती है और बेने के स्वीट प्रिंसेस इरुलान को अपने लिए एक सोर्स ऑफ इन्फॉर्मेशन और मैनिकुलेशन टूल की तरह इस्तेमाल करती है और ऐसे में प्रिंसेस इरुलान को ये तय करना होगा की उनके लिए फादर और उनके सिस्टरहुड में से कौन सबसे ज्यादा इम्पोर्टेंट है अब इस पर से ये कहा जा सकता है दोस्तों कि फ्लोरेंस इरुलान ये कैरेक्टर ना फोक के नरेशन के लिए काफी अहम होने वाला है और फ्लोरेंस पुक तो जानी ही जाती है ऐसे इम्पोर्टेंट और कॉम्प्लेक्स कैरेक्टर प्ले करने के लिए इसलिए ये देखना काफी दिलचस्प होने वाला है की वो अपने इस नए कैरेक्टर को किस तरह से प्ले करती है किस तरह से निभाती है तो आपका इस पर क्या कहना है हमें कमेंट्स में जरूर बताएं साथ ही वीडियो अच्छी लगी हो तो वीडियो को लाइक और शेयर करें डॉक्टर डेनिस विलेनियोवे की टू पार्ट फिल्म अडाप्शन में जैसा बताया गया है उसके मुताबिक 
बेनी गेस्ट एक रिलीजियस सिस्टरहुड है जिनके ऑर्डर की अगर बात की जाए तो वो टेन थाउजेंड ईयर्स पुरानी है और ड्यून यूनिवर्स का एक मेजर पॉलिटिकल फोर्स है और बेनी गेस्ट्रीट की क्वासी है हॉन्गकोंग रेवरेंट मदर गयूस हेलिन मोहियम सीधा पादिशाह एम्पर शब्दाम फोर के काफी करीब है और यही आउटसाइड लेवल ऑफ इन्फ्लुएंस की वजह से आउटसाइडर्स बेने गेस्ट्रीट को बचस के रूप में लेवल करते हैं और ये बिल्कुल भी अन्याय नहीं है क्योंकि वो पूरी एक सिविलाइजेशन को शेप करती है और खुद को एम्पायर और उसके ग्रेट हाउसेस के हम्बल सर्वेंट्स की तरह प्रेजेंट करती है दोस्तों इसके साथ ही सिस्टरहुड के मेंबर्स सुपर ह्यूमन फिजिकल और मेंटल एबिलिटीज पोजिटिव करते हैं और यही बात बेने गेस्ट्रीट के सुपर नेचुरल और सराउंडिंग को और भी ज्यादा बढ़ावा देती है अगर इन पावर्स की बात की जाए तो ये पावर्स इंक्लूड करती है इनक्रेडिबल मार्शल आर्ट प्रोसेस दूसरे के लाइज यानी कि झूठ को डिटेक्ट करना और साथ ही द वॉइस जो कि एक तरह का वर्बल कंपल्शन है उसे फॉर्मेशन करना इसके साथ ही बेनी गेस्ट्रो सिस्टर्स का अपनी बॉडी पर टोटल कंट्रोल होता है वो खुद की एजिंग प्रोसेस को स्लो कर सकते हैं जी हाँ डेडली पॉइजन को प्रोसेस कर सकते हैं और यहाँ तक की वो जो बच्चा कैरी करती है उनके जेंडर का भी पता लगा सकते उनका साथ ही रेवरेंट मदर्स की बात की जाए तो फिर उनके पास एडिशनल गिफ्ट्स होती हैं जैसे कि अदर मेमोरी यानी कि ऐसी एबिलिटी जिससे कि वो अपनी फीमेल एंसेस्टर्स के माइंड से कनेक्ट हो सकती है अब इन एबिलिटीज को फिल्म में किस तरह से दिखाया गया है किस तरह से अडेप्ट किया जाता है ये देखना काफी दिलचस्प होने वाला है तो आपका इन सब पर क्या कहना है इन कास्ट और कैरेक्टर्स के बारे में आप क्या सोचते हैं हमें कॉमेंट्स में जरूर बताए साथ ही वीडियो अच्छी लगी हो तो वीडियो को लाइक और शेयर करें movies aren't just movies but they take you on some different planet for sure but isn't it weird that we as audience dig in deep every aspect of it as if it's our own personal story man and welcome to hollywood where stars aren't just on the red carpet they are scattered across the vast expanse of the cosmos i mean from interstellar that made you travel across galaxies weaving this cosmic tapestry of love sacrifice and the very fabric of reality itself to open high mob that eventually delves into the shadows of history where morality blurs and the line between triumph and tragedy is drawn in blood and fire we now have something really interesting your way we're talking about one more banger on the story of sciences dune part 2 and before you ask me if it's important to go through the part 1 released in 2019 you are absolutely right my friend both of the films are 120% connected to each other but don't worry what am i doing here obviously to help you know about every bit na i'm going to give you a brief introduction about the part 1 so that it's quite an easy job for you to relate with the second the story is quite similar to the tamil industry banger bahubali that was all about the revenge taken in the name of his father for justice to the king's crown Dune Part One displays an intra-family dispute where the hero's own family members killed his father and left him unseen in a weird, deserted area, which provoked him to take a revenge, for which he made his own army consisting of agitated and helpless people seeking for some kind of revenge. The hero is seen to be their only support for reasons A for being a mind reader whenever and wherever and B because he comes up with some magical powers. But all of these seems to be impossible without an extraordinary character knowingly sandworm whose only friendship also could be a boon in a million ways. Now the question arises that being full of motive and so straight forward what is that crisp twist in the film? Well, it starts with a horrible dream of the hero back then where he is casted as the reason for the death of 1000 people not in the name of independence but destruction of human kind. But question arises that what's that one thing about it for it being called as one of the best designed film that even movies like Batman or Marvels are challenged is its deep knowledge and the execution of past, present and future in just 2.5 hours well rightly said intelligent cinema for intelligent people so make sure you carry your brain along with you 
Because of its mega budget, the film guarantees a hundred percent best VFX and visuals in general. So what else is needed, man? The factor that makes this film stand out of the crowd is definitely its involvement in public and family emotions that have worked really strong in connecting the audience. It is also hard to predict the actions of the characters in Dune Two, as it's highly unpredictable in the film. I mean, you can't even cast them good. You can't even cast them bad. They're like all really similar. Well, the best part is that the makers this time have definitely not forced the hero villain angle and has let the movie go as per convenience. In short, the film is a complete banger in terms of storytelling, character casting, and full money time worth, man. I'll definitely rate it a four point five out of five. I mean, could have given it a five, but the only reason has to be its climax, not apparently perceived as a climax. Well, the film definitely is going to have a part three. Seems clearly from its ending. We wish the film a very all the best, and you guys should just give it a try, man. I mean, I bet you won't regret. Well, that was it with the video. Go watch the movie and comment down here your favorite part of the movie. Till then, sayonara and keep watching Bollywood Studios. One of the scenes in Dune Two made people pass out. Best known for playing the titular role in Baz Luhrmann's acclaimed biopic Elvis, Austin Butler is one of the several actors making their franchise debut in Denis Villeneuve's Dune Part Two. He stars as the devious Fade Rotha, a key member of the Harkonnen clan, and in an interview with the Entertainment Weekly, he opened up about how production on the film wasn't for the faint of heart. While Dune Part Two wasn't Butler's first rodeo with a blockbuster, he found production to be daunting, especially in the desert heat. It was 110 degrees and so hot. Butler said of his scenes in the desert planet of Arrakis, which were filmed in Budapest, Hungary. I had the bald cap on, and it was between two sound stages that were just these grey boxes of 200 foot walls and sand. It became like a microwave. The actor explained before adding that some people on set passed out due to heart stroke, and that was just my first week. Despite how grueling production got because of the weather conditions, Butler looked back on the experience fondly. It really bonds the entire crew. He added, "There's something so humbling about being in such an uncomfortable environment. Filming Dune in the desert was a challenge. One of the reasons why first Dune was so successful was the mix of sound stages and real life locations. A decent portion of both films were shot in desert environments, so the films would feel lived in and real." In a chat with the New York Times before the release of the first Dune, director Dennis Villeneuve. Really Discussed that it was so important for his mental sanity to film in the desert. You cannot do that with green screens, he said. It's not possible. Not for me. Maybe some people can, but not me. Filming in the desert has its fair share of challenges, as highlighted by Austin Butler. However, the actor was only brought on board for Dune Part Two. This wasn't the case for Timothy Chalamet, who has been with Dune since the start of the film. While speaking with Stephen Colbert to promote the first picture, Calumet talked about how filming would happen at specific times so the cast and crew could beat the desert heat. It would get so hot during the day that sometimes you had to shoot between 5 a.m. and 7 a.m. and 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. He said, adding that the suits used by the characters to traverse through the desert were ironically bulky and sweaty, making filming particularly challenging. As eager as Villeneuve was to film in the desert, he was also happy to have gotten a break between productions. Both movies were made in a very harsh conditions, and it's very physically taxing. So to have a break in between them was a blessing. The director told Entertainment Weekly. Why the desert is so important for Dennis Villeneuve? Dennis Villeneuve is a perfectionist, which is why it's not surprising that Quebec-born filmmaker was interested in authenticity every step of the way. Seeing as Arrakis is at heart of Frank Herbert's Dune franchise, Villeneuve tried his darndest not to half-ass one of his favorite sci-fi novels. While the first Dune spends a considerable time on Arrakis, it's Dune too that shows the diversity of the planet, taking viewers to the treacherous southern regions of the sand planet. Finding the right vibe for certain scenes was difficult, as no two sand dunes are alike. While speaking with Empire. 
Villeneuve opened up about the collaborative process between himself, cinematographer Greg Fraser, and production designer Patrus Vermet to find the right filming locations for the sequel. For my scene, I'll want a particular shaped dune, but Greg Fraser, on the other hand, will need that same shape to be in a specific light. Villeneuve told the outlet, so Patrus spent weeks and weeks casting sand dunes in the desert. We looked like madmen for the crew of Dune characters. Villeneuve is no doubt a visionary, a creative who is ready to take the desert and put his cast and crew through arduous conditions purely for the sake of our entertainment. The director's philosophy largely stems from his love for the source material which he's been obsessed with since his youth. In a chat with The Atlantic, Villeneuve candidly stated that the first Dune was made for himself, saying, everything you receive is there because I love it. हॉलीवुड मतलब सुपर हीरो साईफाई और फ्यूचरिस्टिक फिल्मों का भंडार और ऐसे में एक फ्यूचरिस्टिक फिल्म 2021 में रिलीज हुई थी जिसका नाम है ड्यून और उसका सेकेंड पार्ट 2024 में रिलीज हो चुका है वैसे बहुत लोग ये सोचते हैं कि इस फिल्म को स्टार वॉर और गेम ऑफ थ्रोन जैसी फिल्मों ने इंस्पायर किया है पर ऐसा नहीं है हाँ डेफिनेटली कुछ सिमिलैरिटीज तो हैं पर वो भी इसलिए क्योंकि ड्यून से ही इन फिल्मों ने इंस्पिरेशन ली है ये तो कुछ नया है आगे चलते हैं कि कैसे इंस्पिरेशन ली गई है इसलिए हम इसलिए हम साइंस फिक्शन और एक फैंटेसी एलिमेंट से भरपूर फिल्म की बात करेंगे जिसमें स्टार वॉर का नाम पहले आता है डून और स्टार वॉर में कई सारी सिमिलैरिटीज हैं जैसे कि दोनों फिल्में फ्यूचरिस्टिक सेटिंग के साथ मौजूद हैं लेकिन जबकि स्टार वॉर पूरी गैलेक्सी में फैली हुई है तो ड्यून की घटनाएं मुख्य रूप से प्लानट्स पर बेस्ड हैं खासकर युद्ध के मैदान अराकिस पर फिर भी ड्यून के कोरिना साम्राज्य गैलिटक साम्राज्य की पूरी तरह से ब्रह्मांड में फैला हुआ है नेक्स्ट इस स्टार वॉर्स यूनिवर्स के सबसे पहचानने योग्य एस्पेक्ट्स में आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस सबसे पहले आता है लेकिन ड्यून की फ्यूचरिस्टिक दुनिया बिल्कुल अपोजिट है टेक्निकल एडवांस होने के बावजूद ह्यूमैनिटी ए या सोचने वाली मशीनों के यूज को एक्सेप्ट नहीं करती यह देखने के बाद भी कि कैसे उनकी जिंदगी पर उनका डोमिनेंस था आखिर में बटलियन जिहाज में भी सभी मशीनों को डिस्ट्रॉय कर दिया गया और उनके किसी प्रोडक्शन को पूरे यूनिवर्स में बैन भी कर दिया गया अगर ड्यून में स्पाइस नामक वह मसाला है जिससे कि इंसान को सुपर पावर्स मिलती हैं जिससे इंसान की आंखें नीली हो जाती हैं तो स्टार वॉर्स में भी फोर्स है जो फ्यूचर देखने में आपको मदद करती है और इंसान को ऐसा बना देती है कि वो किसका भी फ्यूचर कैसे भी देख सकता है उससे इंसान के अंदर की स्ट्रेंथ और पावर दोनों बढ़ जाती है वैसे हम सभी स्टार वॉर्स के प्रोटेगनिस्ट ल्यूक स्काई को टाटून के युवा किसान लड़के के रूप में जानते हैं जो बड़ा होकर साम्राज्य से लड़ेगा और जेडी बनेगा लेकिन ड्यून का प्रोटेगनिस्ट पॉल हाउस एट्राइट का उत्तराधिकारी है और अराकिस ग्रह पर कंट्रोल के लिए हाउस हरकोनिन और कोरिना साम्राज्य के खिलाफ युद्ध में शामिल है ल्यूक और पॉल अपने अपने सरकार को उखाड़ फेंकेंगे और एंड में एक न्यू वर्ल्ड को स्थापित करने में मदद करेंगे जिससे उनके कारनामे असल में प्रणाणिक बन जाएंगे तो दोनों फिल्में के जो प्रोटेगनिस्ट हैं कुछ नया और एडवेंचर करने के रास्ते पर हमें दिखाई देते हैं तो यहाँ करेक्टर के मामले में भी ये सबसे ज्यादा इंस्पिरेशनल है हाँ ये बात तो सच है कि स्टार वॉर्स एक बेहतर फिल्म है पर यह जो सिमिलैरिटीज हैं वो ड्यून के कारण है जो एक इंस्पिरेशन है सबसे इंपॉर्टेंट बात तो ये है 1965 में अमेरिकन राइटर फ्रैंक हर्बर्ट ने लिखी नॉवल ड्यून पर ही फिल्म ड्यून बनी पर नॉवल में मौजूद चीजें बड़े पर्दे पर बड़े लेवल पर प्रेजेंट करना वह भी ऑडियंस को समझ आए इस तरह से यह तो बहुत ही चैलेंजिंग टास्क था जो कि ड्यून के मेकर्स ने कर दिखाया है इसके दोनों पार्ट्स में और इसे ही स्टार वॉर्स ने फॉलो किया है तो जो पहला चमत्कार है वो ड्यून ने ही किया है लेकिन सवाल ये है कि क्या ये सच है कि झूठ है ड्यून पहले आई थी स्टार वॉर्स पहले आई थी किसने किसको फॉलो किया किसने किससे इंस्पिरेशन लिया आप हमें कमेंट सेक्शन में बताना मत भूलिएगा देखना चाहता हूँ कि मेरी ऑडियंस जो है किस तरह से इसको समझती है दूसरी बात आती है कि दूसरी फिल्म दूसरी फिल्म कौन सी है दूसरी फिल्म है गेम ऑफ थ्रोन्स गेम ऑफ थ्रोन्स फिल्म नहीं एक वेब सीरीज है गेम ऑफ थ्रोन्स भी ड्यून से ही इंस्पायर्ड है जो कि 2011 से लेकर 2019 तक अपनी एक सीरीज बना चुकी है पहले तो उसकी सिमिलैरिटीज देखते हैं ड्यून और गेम ऑफ थ्रोन्स दोनों में ग्रेट हाउस एक साथ नहीं मिल पाते हैं ड्यून में हाउस हार्केन का हाउस एट्राइड्स के साथ पुराना झगड़ा है और हाउस टार्स और हाउस लैनिस्टर गेम ऑफ थ्रोन्स में इसी को दोहराते नजर आते हैं बस करेक्टर नेम्स अंदाज थोड़ा अलग होता है हार्कोनिन की तरह हाउस लैनिस्टर इनक्रेडिबली रिच है और पावर से ऑब्सेस्ड है 
हार्कॉनस और लैनिस्टर की भी आगे बढ़ने के लिए गंदी राजनीति का षड्यंत्र रचते हैं जैसे महाभारत में मामा श्री ने रचा था जो हाउस एट्राइड्स और सम्मान जुनूनी हाउस टास्क के सामने उड़ती हुई दिखाई देती है दोनों कहानियों में हाउस आखिर वॉर में बदल जाता है हाउस लैनिस्टर और हाउस हार्कोनन की वजह से विश्वासघात होता है जो लगभग हाउस एट्राइड्स और हाउस टास्क के डाउनफॉल का कारण भी बनता है ये मुझे लगता है कि सारे के सारे इंस्पिरेशन कहीं और से नहीं महाभारत से जा रही है तो आपको क्या लगता है आप भी बताइए हमें वैसे गेम ऑफ थ्रोन्स में कई कैरेक्टर्स ड्यून से इंस्पायर्ड लगते हैं फ्री वॉक वाइल्ड लाइफ तो फ्रीमैन की तरह है दोनों ग्रुप्स में तो एक युवा मसीहा जैसे फिगर को अपनाते हुए ड्यून में पॉल और गेम ऑफ थ्रोन्स में जॉन स्नो उन्हें अपने तरीकों से सिखाते हैं और लीडरशिप के लिए तैयार करते हैं पॉल और जॉन स्नो खुद हद तक एक दूसरे की कहानी को मिरर करते हैं ग्रुप के मेम्बर्स एक साथ रोमांटिक रिश्ते बनाते हैं ड्यून में पॉल को चानी यानी कि एक्टर जेंडिया और गेम ऑफ थ्रोन्स में जॉन स्नो का या ग्रीट एक, यानी कि एक्ट्रेस रोज लेस्ली के साथ एक लव रिलेशन है बता दे कि इनका लव रिलेशन आधा चलता है आधा झगड़ने में चला जाता है बाकी थोड़ा सा स्पॉइलर हो गया अब कैसे झगड़ते हैं होता कि मूवी और वेब सीरीज देखने पर चलेगा वैसे गेम ऑफ थ्रोन्स का करेक्टर आर एस टाक यानी कि एक्ट्रेस मैसी विलियम्स यह करेक्टर जिसका हाफ ब्रदर जॉन स्नो होता है हाफ ब्रदर माने की सौतेला भाई ऐसा लगता है कि यह ड्यून के पॉल की छोटी बहन आलिया एट्राइड से इंस्पिरेशन लेती है दोनों की बहनें अपने आप में पावरफुल और चाकू चलाने वाली लगती हैं मतलब यहाँ लड़कियाँ देखो चाकू चला रही है ध्यान से आपके जेब भी अपना काट ले तो यह कुछ सिमिलरिटीज हैं जो कि एक्चुअल में इंस्पिरेशन है जिसका ओरिजिन तो ड्यून ही है दूसरी बात यह है कि ड्यून का जो प्लॉट है वो नॉवल बेस्ड होने के बावजूद भी इतना डिफिकल्ट नहीं लगता है समझने में गेम ऑफ थ्रोन्स भी हमें समझने में आएगी क्योंकि वो थोड़ी सी इससे इंस्पायर्ड है और उसमें भी कई कई जगह पर गेम ऑफ थ्रोन्स का प्लॉट कुछ लोगों को डिफिकल्ट तो फॉलो होने में लगा था खैर पर हॉलीवुड की दो बड़ी फैंटेसी और साइंस फिक्शन फिल्मों में स्टार वॉर्स और गेम ऑफ थ्रोन्स का नाम शान से लिया जाता है और उनके सामने अगर हम ड्यून को देखें तो डेफिनेटली वो काफ़ी स्ट्रॉन्ग भी नजर आती है अपनी जबरदस्त सिनेमाटोग्राफी प्लॉट टू प्लॉट डिस्क्रिप्शन स्टोरी लाइन सिर्फ प्लानट्स पर फोकस करके ऑडियंस को एक लार्जर दैन लाइफ एक्सपीरियंस देना यह सारे इसके प्लस पॉइंट्स हैं और इससे डबल एक्सपीरियंस हमें एक सीक्वेंस में नज़र आ सकते हैं तो पार्ट थ्री का इंतज़ार करिए तब तक कि हम आगे जाके बात करेंगे कि कि पूरी की पूरी ड्यून गेम ऑफ थ्रोन्स और बाकी जितने फिक्शनल मूवीज़ हैं कैसे महाभारत से कनेक्टेड है और महाभारत से कैसे कनेक्टेड है हम आपको बाद में बताएंगे अभी आप सब से लेते हैं अलविदा टाटा बाय बाय सी यू नेक्स्ट टाइम फिल्म ड्यून पार्ट वन ये साल 2021 में रिलीज हुई एक साइंस फिक्शन फिल्म है ये फिल्म स्टार वॉर गेम ऑफ थ्रोन्स कई एलियन फ्रेंचाइजी या हॉलीवुड की सारी फिल्मों को इंस्पायर भी कर चुकी है इससे हम फिल्म का पोटेंशियल भी समझ सकते हैं तो ये कहानी है ड्यून नामक एक रेगिस्तान प्लेनेट की ये तकरीबन 8000 साल बाद की फ्यूचर की कहानी है जहाँ प्लेनेट्स पर राज घराने राज करते थे जहाँ एक एम्पर है जो तीन हाउसेस पर नजर रखता है उसमें से है आर्कारिस सबसे पावरफुल हाउस जहाँ स्पाइस जैसा एक सबस्टांस होता है सिंपल भाषा में एक मसाला जिसकी वजह से एक इंसान सुपर पावरफुल बन सकता है और उसकी आंखें नीली हो जाती है पर अगर इसका ज्यादा इस्तेमाल हो तो वो इंसान एडिक्ट भी बन सकता है जैसे एक ड्रग एडिक्ट वैसे ये एक फ्यूल की तरह भी इस्तेमाल होता है जैसे धरती पर हम डीजल पेट्रोल सीएनजी की मदद से वाहन चलाते हैं वैसे ही इसी प्लेनेट पर दूसरे प्लेनेट तक जाने के लिए इसकी बहुत जरूरत पड़ती है वैसे ये फिल्म अमेरिकन राइटर फ्रेंक हर्बर्ट की नाइनटीन में लिखी गई एक नॉवल पर बेस्ड है इसका नाम भी ड्यून ही है और इस बुक के फर्स्ट हाफ पर फिल्म का पहला पार्ट बना है तो सेकेंड हाफ सेकेंड पार्ट पर इस फिल्म के इस फिल्म में पॉल एट्राइड नाम का एक यंग बॉय है जिसका परिवार अराकिस प्लैनेट का मैनेजमेंट एक्सेप्ट करता है अराकिस इनएक्सेबल और एक रेगिस्तानी बंजर जमीन है जहां मिलने वाला स्पाइस मेंटल एबिलिटीज को बढ़ाता है स्पाइस स्पेस नेविगेशन के लिए भी जरूरी है यह देखते हुए कि स्पाइस सिर्फ अराकेस पर प्रोड्यूस होता है प्लानट पर कंट्रोल खतरनाक लेकिन डिजायरेबल होता है तो इसे साइंस फिक्शन एलिमेंट के साथ साथ पॉलिटिकल भी मौजूद है जिस बुक पर यह फिल्म बेस्ड है उसमें और इस फिल्म में कुछ डिफरेंसेस जरूर हैं। बुक में कई सारे फिक्शनल थीम्स कल्चर टेक्नोलॉजी को लेकर बातें की गई हैं, जो कि स्क्रीन पर विजुलाइज करना थोड़ा चैलेंजिंग है इस फिल्म के डायरेक्टर डेनिस वेलेनुवी की ड्यून पार्ट वन एट्राइड फैमिली को लेकर उनके होम प्लेनेट कैलेडन से अरकारिस तक लेके जाती है और वायलेंस और विश्वासघात से भागने के बाद पॉल और जैसिका 
अभ्यारण खोजने के साथ एंड होता है और जबकि कुछ कैरेक्टर्स गायब हैं स्पेशली फायड्रोथा षडयंत्रीकारी बैरन हरोकन और भतीजा और उत्तराधिकारी प्लॉट में मिनिमम चेंजेस हैं पर विलनिवी स्मॉल मोर इंटेंस इंटरेस्टिंग प्लॉट पॉइंट्स और कहानी की यूज एपिक स्केल दोनों पर फोकस करते हैं वैसे नोवल में हर्बर्ट में कैरेक्टर के दूसरे कैरेक्टर की ओर ले जाते हैं हम देखते हैं कि वे कौन है वो किससे प्यार करते हैं किससे नफरत करते हैं और क्या चीज उन्हें प्रभावित करती है ये फिल्म विद ह्यूज कास्ट और इतनी बड़ी कहानी के साथ है कि समझ आता है कि कैरेक्टर्स के बीच रिलेशनशिप की डेप्थ साथ ही इंडिविजुअल कैरेक्टर डेवलपमेंट शायद उतना एक्सटेंसिवली एक्सप्लेन नहीं किया गया है या नहीं दिखाया गया है जितना कि नॉवल में दिखाया गया है हर्बर्ट के ड्यून से विलनिवे के बड़े चेंजेस में से एक पॉल का स्पाइस के प्रति एक्सपोजर है जबकि नॉवल के पॉल को स्पाइस के कॉन्टेक्ट में आने पर अपने विजन और अपनी पावर्स पर उसके इफेक्ट्स का एक्सपीरियंस करने से ज्यादा टाइम लगता है पर फिल्म के पॉल को लगभग तुरंत ही हाइपर सेंसिटिव दिखाया गया है एक रेस्क्यू ऑपरेशन के दौरान वह हेलुसलेशन का शिकार हो जाता है और बाद में टेंट की हवा के मसाले से प्रभावित होता है यह बदलाव असल में बड़े पर्दे के लिए बहुत मायने रखते हैं नॉवल के बेसिस के बिना किसी की रिएक्शन देखे बिना स्पाइस के इम्पोर्टेंस और पावर को बताना डिफिकल्ट है फिल्म में हमें बेने गैसिरेट थू फिर हवाद गुरिन हेल्के पीटर देवरिस शेड आउट मॉप्स डॉक्टर यू और स्टीला गर्ल के सिर्फ ग्लिम्सेज यानी की झलक मिलती है जो सभी ड्यून के प्लॉट के लिए जरूरी है और बहुत ज्यादा डेवलप्ड है नॉवल में जैसे मोमोआ के डंकन हेडवा को ज्यादा स्क्रीन टाइम मिलता है जबकि जेंडिया की चानी प्राइमरी ड्रीमी विजन में दिखाई जाती है और वॉइस ओवर नरेशन में वर्ल्ड बिल्डिंग या पॉलिटिकल कॉन्टेक्स के डिफरेंट इंपॉर्टेंट स्पीसीज को समझाती है अब बात करते हैं ड्यून के सेकेंड पार्ट की जो रिलीज हो चुका है फर्स्ट मार्च दो को और फ्रेंक हर्बर्ट के नॉवल को फिल्म के डायरेक्टर ने इस बार भी अच्छी तरह से डिस्क्राइब करने की कोशिश की है विलेनुवे ने एक बार फिर नोवेल के सेकंड हाफ को बारीकी से प्रेजेंट करने का काम तो किया है पर ड्यून टू ने एक ऐसा ज्यादा ओकेशन पर नोवेल्स को बदल दिया है मतलब कुछ बदलाव इस फिल्म में ऐसे हैं जो कि आप नोवेल पढ़ेंगे तो आपको समझ आएगा कि इतना डिफरेंस क्यों है चाहे वे कहानी से पूरे करेक्टर को मिसिंग होना या कहानी के बाकी डिटेल्स को डिफरेंस करने में हो अब फिल्म ड्यून में ड्यून टाइम बदल जाती है क्योंकि डेनिस वेलेनुवे की अगली कड़ी किताब में होने वाली टाइम जम को हटा देती है ये फिल्म ड्यून के खत्म होने के इवेंट्स के ठीक बात की है और जिसका की प्रेगनेंसी कैसे आगे बढ़ती है इस पर डिपेंड करते हुए फिल्म के दौरान केवल कुछ महीने ही गुजरते हैं ये नोवेल से डिफरेंट है क्योंकि पॉल के फ्रीमैन का हिस्सा बनने के तुरंत बाद फ्रैंक हर्बर ने दो साल का टाइम जम्प इम्प्लीमेंट किया था ये रिलेशनशिप डिफरेंटली डेवलप कैसे होते हैं उसको अलाउ करती है और पॉल के पावर के आने को स्पीड को स्लो कर देती है ड्यून टू टाइम जम्प को हटा पूरी स्पीड में बढ़ाती है आगे की स्टोरी को वैसे ड्यून टू से मिसिंग है एक करेक्टर जिसका नोवल में प्रोमिनेंट रोल था वह है काउंट फेंडिंग वह हाउस कोरिनो का हिस्सा है जो ट्रेन हथियारे और एडवाइजर को सम्राट शादाम का रिश्तेदार करीब दोस्त और सलाहकार बनाता है जबकि ड्यून टू में उनकी पत्नी लेडी मार्गरेट फैनरिंग शामिल है लेकिन वह कहीं नहीं मिले पर नोवल में एम्पर फैनरिंग का पोल को मारने का ऑर्डर देता है वैसे ड्यून पार्ट टू नोवल की टाइम को छोटा कर देता है इससे होल स्टोरी में और भी ज्यादा चेंजेस आते हैं और इस फिल्म में पॉल की बहन आलिया अडराइस का जन्म नहीं हुआ है पर नोवल में आलिया का जन्म उस वक्त हुआ है जब पॉल और जेसिका फ्रीमैन के साथ गहरे रेगिस्तान में रह रहे थे जेसिका प्रेग्नेंट होने पर जीवन का जल लेती है क्योंकि जेसिका प्रेग्नेंट होने पर जीवन का जल लेती है जिससे आलिया गर्भ से बाहर आते ही अपने पूर्वजों की सभी यादों के साथ पूर्व जर्मनी हो जाती है लेकिन फिल्म ड्यून पार्ट टू में हम बेबी आलिया को उभरते हुए नहीं देखते हैं और इसके बजाय जैसिका अपनी अजन्मी बेटी से धीमे से बात करती है और एंड में हमें जैसिका के सिर में आलिया की आवाज सुनाई देती है जब वह कहती है क्या हो रहा है माँ वैसे पोल की लव इंटरेस्ट चानी के रूप में एक्ट्रेस इंडिया के एक्सलेंट कैरेक्टर के बारे में बात करते हुए कहा जाता है कि उस कैरेक्टर से थोड़ा बदला हुआ है जो नोवल में है पूरे ड्यून पार्ट टू में ये चानी क्लियर कर देती है कि वह लिसन अल गैप की भविष्यवाणी को एक बुरी चीज के रूप में देखती है और फीमेन को और अधिक गुलाम बनाने का एक तरीका है वैसे नॉवल में चानी पॉल के सपोर्ट में खड़ी है और हर चीज का सपोर्ट करती है चाहे वो पॉलिटिकल पार्टी से चीजों के लिए राजकुमारी यूलानी से शादी करने का फैसला क्यों ना हो फिल्म में चानी फिल्म का आधा हिस्सा पॉल के प्यार में डूब कर बिताती है और आधा हिस्सा उससे पूरी तरह से नाराज होकर बिताती है यहाँ एक चेंज है यह कि डॉन पार्ट टू में वो प्रेगनेंट नहीं होती अपने और पॉल के पहले बच्चे के साथ पर नोवल में उसका और पॉल का एक बेटा है जो कि हमले के दौरान मारा जाता है तो भैया चेंजेस तो हैं नोवल और फिल्म में थोड़ा बहुत नहीं बहुत ज्यादा अंतर है 
वैसे फर्स्ट और सेकेंड पार्ट के बाद अब हो सकता है कि ड्रोन ट्रायलॉजी भी बन सकती है और स्लोली स्लोली ड्रोन यूनिवर्स भी हो सकता है क्या पता डायरेक्टर्स और मेकर्स के दिमाग में क्या चल रहा है लेकिन दोनों पार्ट बहुत ही धासु हैं जिसने पहला पार्ट नहीं देखा वो पहला पार्ट देखे फिर दूसरा पार्ट देखने के थिएटर में जाए जिसने पहला पार्ट देख लिया वो थिएटर में जाके मूवी देखे क्योंकि बहुत धासु मूवी बनी है आप सभी का मैं करता हूँ तह दिल से नमस्कार सुप्रभात गुड नाइट अब मैं लेता हूँ आपसे अलविदा और जाऊँगा सोने Cult of personality. Dune, Paul Atreides, also known as Muad'Dib, develops a messianic persona among the freemen, the native inhabitants of Arrakis. Through his leadership and strategic prowess, Paul becomes a figure of reverence and devotion, fulfilling ancient prophecies and leading his followers to victory. Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein cultivated a cult of personality around himself, presenting himself as a strong and benevolent leader who was destined to lead Iraq to greatness. His image was omnipresent in Iraqi society, with portraits, statues, and murals depicting him as a heroic figure. Authoritarian rule. Dune. The world of Dune is characterized by feudalism, with noble houses vying for control under the overarching authority of the Padasha Emperor. Paul Atreides, upon seizing power, establishes himself as the ruler of Arrakis and later ascends to the position of emperor, wielding absolute authority over the known universe. Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein ruled Iraq with an iron fist, employing a combination of secret police, propaganda, and repression to maintain control over his subjects. Dissent was met with swift and brutal punishment, and Saddam's regime was characterized by widespread human rights abuses and political oppression. Utilization of fear and intimidation. Dune, Paul Atreides recognizes the power of fear as a tool of control and manipulation. He employs tactics such as the strategic use of the freemen's reputation as fearsome warriors and the threat of the sandworms to instill fear in his enemies and maintain his authority. Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein's regime was infamous for its use of fear and intimidation to suppress dissent and maintain control. His secret police, the Mukhabarat, operated with impunity, using torture, extrajudicial killings, and mass executions to quash opposition. Pursuit of weapons of mass destruction. Dune. In the world of Dune, the spice melange is a highly coveted resource with powerful psychoactive properties. The control of Arrakis and the spice trade is a central element of the political intrigue, with various factions vying for dominance over this valuable commodity. Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein's regime was accused of pursuing weapons of mass destruction, including chemical and biological weapons, in violation of international agreements. This pursuit of WMDs became a central justification for the United States-led invasion of Iraq in 2003. Conclusion. In conclusion, while Dune is a work of fiction and Saddam Hussein was a real-life dictator, the parallels between the two are striking. Both narratives explore themes of power, ambition, and the consequences of unchecked authority. By examining the similarities between Dune and Saddam Hussein, we gain a deeper understanding of the complexities of leadership, politics, and human nature. In the vast expanse of the literary cosmos, certain works stand as towering monuments, casting their shadows across the landscape of human imagination. Among these luminaries, Frank Herbert's Dune emerges as a beacon of unparalleled brilliance, a monumental work of science fiction that has captured the hearts and minds of readers for generations. With its intricate world-building, complex characters, and exploration of timeless themes, Dune transcends the confines of genre fiction to offer a profound meditation on the human condition. Similarly, the Middle East, a region steeped in history, culture, and geopolitical complexity, presents itself as a rich tapestry of diversity, tradition, and resilience. From the ancient civilizations of Mesopotamia to the modern-day metropolises of the Arabian Peninsula, the Middle East encompasses a kaleidoscope of cultures, religions, and political landscapes, each layering upon the other to create a mosaic of complexity and contradiction. In this introductory chapter, we embark on a journey of exploration, an odyssey that seeks to uncover the hidden connections and resonances between Dune and the Middle East. We set the stage for our comprehensive comparative analysis, providing an overview of the purpose and scope of our study and highlighting the significance of delving into the parallels between a seminal work of science fiction and a region with rich historical, cultural, and geopolitical complexities.
At its core, our analysis seeks to elucidate the profound parallels between Dune and the Middle East, drawing upon themes of power, politics, religion, culture, and societal dynamics to deepen our understanding of both narratives. By examining the connections between Dune, a work renowned for its visionary scope and profound insights, and the Middle East, a region marked by centuries of struggle, resilience, and transformation, we aim to shed light on the shared motifs, themes, and dynamics that underpin both narratives. Frank Herbert's Dune serves as our guiding star, a monumental work that has left an indelible mark on the literary landscape. With its sprawling narrative, richly imagined universe, and complex characters, Dune challenges readers to confront questions of power, identity, and destiny, offering a mirror through which to explore the depths of the human soul. Similarly, the Middle East beckons us with its rich tapestry of history, culture, and tradition, a region that has served as the cradle of civilization, the crossroads of empires, and the battleground of ideologies. From the ancient cities of Babylon and Jerusalem to the modern-day metropolises of Cairo and Tehran, the Middle East bears witness to the ebb and flow of human history, offering a wealth of insights into the complexities of human society and governance. As we embark on this journey of exploration, we invite readers to join us in unraveling the mysteries of Dune and the Middle East, to peer beyond the veil of fiction and history, and to uncover the timeless truths that lie beneath. Through our analysis, we hope to illuminate the hidden connections and resonances between these two seemingly disparate worlds, offering new perspectives on the human experience and the enduring quest for meaning and understanding. Origins of Dune, a science fiction epic. To understand the genesis of Dune, we must first trace its origins within the vast and varied landscape of science fiction literature. Born out of the fertile imagination of author Frank Herbert, Dune emerged in the tumultuous era of the 1960s, a time of great social upheaval, scientific advancement, and cultural transformation, drawing inspiration from a diverse array of sources, including ecology, anthropology, and philosophy. Herbert crafted a visionary tale that transcended the conventions of traditional science fiction. At its core, Dune is a story of power, politics, and prophecy, a sweeping epic that spans generations and galaxies. Set in a distant future where humanity has spread across the stars, Dune explores the interplay of religion, technology, and ecology on a desert planet known as Arrakis. Here, amidst the shifting sands and fierce storms, a young nobleman named Paul Atreides embarks on a journey of self-discovery and destiny, ultimately becoming the messianic figure known as Muad'Dib. Sociopolitical Landscapes, Feudalism and Imperialism Central to the narrative of Dune is its portrayal of feudal society and imperial governance, a complex web of alliances, rivalries, and power struggles that shape the fate of entire civilizations. In the universe of Dune, noble houses vie for control over valuable resources such as spice, the lifeblood of interstellar travel and commerce. At the apex of this hierarchy sits the Padisha Emperor, whose authority is upheld by a feudal system of vassalage and tribute. The feudal society depicted in Dune bears striking parallels to historical and contemporary political structures in the Middle East. From the empires of antiquity to the modern-day monarchies and autocracies, the Middle East has been characterized by a similar system of hierarchical governance, where power is concentrated in the hands of ruling elites and noble families. Like the noble houses of Dune, these ruling elites often engage in intricate political maneuvering and alliances to maintain their grip on power and influence power dynamics and societal hierarchies. At the heart of both Dune and the Middle East lies a complex tapestry of power dynamics and societal hierarchies. In Dune, the struggle for power extends beyond the noble houses to encompass religious orders, indigenous peoples, and imperial factions. Beneath the surface of Arrakis, a vast ecosystem of intrigue and ambition unfolds, with each faction vying for dominance in a relentless game of politics and power. Similarly, the Middle East has been shaped by centuries of political maneuvering and power struggles, with rival factions and external powers vying for control over territory, resources, and influence. From the ancient empires of Mesopotamia to the modern-day nation-states of the region, the Middle East has been characterized by a complex interplay of competing interests and shifting alliances, with power often concentrated in the hands of a select few. By examining the historical and literary context of both Dune and the Middle East, we lay the groundwork for a deeper exploration of their thematic connections. Through our analysis, we aim to uncover the hidden parallels and resonances that bind these two narratives together. In the vast expanse of the literary cosmos, certain works stand as towering monuments, 
casting their shadows across the landscape of human imagination. Among these luminaries, Frank Herbert's Dune emerges as a beacon of unparalleled brilliance, a monumental work of science fiction that has captured the hearts and minds of readers for generations. With its intricate world-building, complex characters, and exploration of timeless themes, Dune transcends the confines of genre fiction to offer a profound meditation on the human condition. Similarly, the Middle East, a region steeped in history, culture, and geopolitical complexity, presents itself as a rich tapestry of diversity, tradition, and resilience. From the ancient civilizations of Mesopotamia to the modern-day metropolises of the Arabian Peninsula, the Middle East encompasses a kaleidoscope of cultures, religions, and political landscapes, each layering upon the other to create a mosaic of complexity and contradiction. In this introductory chapter, we embark on a journey of exploration, an odyssey that seeks to uncover the hidden connections and resonances between Dune and the Middle East. We set the stage for our comprehensive comparative analysis, providing an overview of the purpose and scope of our study and highlighting the significance of delving into the parallels between a seminal work of science fiction and a region with rich historical, cultural, and geopolitical complexities. At its core, our analysis seeks to elucidate the profound parallels between Dune and the Middle East, drawing upon themes of power, politics, religion, culture, and societal dynamics to deepen our understanding of both narratives. By examining the connections between Dune, a work renowned for its visionary scope and profound insights, and the Middle East, a region marked by centuries of struggle, resilience, and transformation, we aim to shed light on the shared motifs, themes, and dynamics that underpin both narratives. Frank Herbert's Dune serves as our guiding star, a monumental work that has left an indelible mark on the literary landscape. With its sprawling narrative, richly imagined universe, and complex characters, Dune challenges readers to confront questions of power, identity, and destiny, offering a mirror through which to explore the depths of the human soul. Similarly, the Middle East beckons us with its rich tapestry of history, culture, and tradition, a region that has served as the cradle of civilization, the crossroads of empires, and the battleground of ideologies. From the ancient cities of Babylon and Jerusalem to the modern-day metropolises of Cairo and Tehran, the Middle East bears witness to the ebb and flow of human history. Offering a wealth of insights into the complexities of human society and governance, as we embark on this journey of exploration, we invite readers to join us in unraveling the mysteries of Dune and the Middle East, to peer beyond the veil of fiction and history, and to uncover the timeless truths that lie beneath. Through our analysis, we hope to illuminate the hidden connections and resonances between these two seemingly disparate worlds, offering new perspectives on the human experience and the enduring quest for meaning and understanding. Origins of Dune, a science fiction epic, to understand the genesis of Dune, we must first trace its origins within the vast and varied landscape of science fiction literature. Born out of the fertile imagination of author Frank Herbert, Dune emerged in the tumultuous era of the 1960s, a time of great social upheaval, scientific advancement, and cultural transformation. Drawing inspiration from a diverse array of sources, including ecology, anthropology, and philosophy, Herbert crafted a visionary tale that transcended the conventions of traditional science fiction. At its core, Dune is a story of power, politics, and prophecy, a sweeping epic that spans generations and galaxies. At its core, Dune is a story of power, politics, and prophecy, a sweeping epic that spans generations and galaxies. Set in a distant future where humanity has spread across the stars, Dune explores the interplay of religion, technology, and ecology on a desert planet known as Arrakis. Here, amidst the shifting sands and fierce storms, a young nobleman named Paul Atreides embarks on a journey of self-discovery and destiny, ultimately becoming the messianic figure known as Muad'Dib, socio-political landscapes, feudalism and imperialism, central to the narrative of Dune is its portrayal of feudal society and imperial governance, a complex web of alliances, rivalries, and power struggles that shape the fate of entire civilizations. In the universe of Dune, noble houses vie for control over valuable resources such as spice, the lifeblood of interstellar travel and commerce. At the apex of this hierarchy sits the Padishah Emperor, 
whose authority is upheld by a feudal system of vassalage and tribute, the feudal society depicted in Dune bears striking parallels to historical and contemporary political structures in the Middle East. From the empires of antiquity to the modern-day monarchies and autocracies, the Middle East has been characterized by a similar system of hierarchical governance, where power is concentrated in the hands of ruling elites and noble families. Like the noble houses of Dune, these ruling elites often engage in intricate political maneuvering and alliances to maintain their grip on power and influence. Power dynamics and societal hierarchies, at the heart of both Dune and the Middle East lies a complex tapestry of power dynamics and societal hierarchies. In Dune, the struggle for power extends beyond the noble houses to encompass religious orders, indigenous peoples, and imperial factions. Beneath the surface of Arrakis, a vast ecosystem of intrigue and ambition unfolds, with each faction vying for dominance in a relentless game of politics and power. Similarly, the Middle East has been shaped by centuries of political maneuvering and power struggles, with rival factions and external powers vying for control over territory, resources, and influence. From the ancient empires of Mesopotamia to the modern-day nation-states of the region, the Middle East has been characterized by a complex interplay of competing interests and shifting alliances. With power often concentrated in the hands of a select few, by examining the historical and literary context of both Dune and the Middle East, we lay the groundwork for a deeper exploration of their thematic connections. Through our analysis, we aim to uncover the hidden parallels and resonances that bind these two narratives together, offering new insights into the complexities of power, politics, and society in both fictional and real-world contexts, noble houses in Dune, ambition and intrigue, at the heart of Dune's political landscape lies the intricate web of noble houses, each vying for power, influence, and control over valuable resources such as spice. From House Atriites to House Harkonnen, these noble families navigate a treacherous world of political intrigue, betrayal, and alliances, with each seeking to outmaneuver their rivals and secure their place within the imperial hierarchy, drawing parallels to historical and contemporary political dynamics in the Middle East, we see similarities in the influence of tribal allegiances, familial ties, and geopolitical ambitions on power struggles within the region. Like the noble houses of Dune, ruling elites in the Middle East often form alliances based on familial connections, tribal affiliations, and strategic interests, with each faction seeking to consolidate its power and expand its sphere of influence. Centralization of power and regional autonomy, in both Dune and the Middle East, the tension between centralized authority and regional autonomy plays a central role in shaping political dynamics and power struggles. In Dune, the Padishah Emperor serves as the ultimate arbiter of power, wielding authority over the noble houses and ensuring their compliance with imperial law. However, beneath the veneer of imperial control lies a complex network of regional power bases, each vying for autonomy and independence from centralized authority. Similarly, in the Middle East, the balance of power between centralized governments and regional actors has long been a source of tension and conflict. From the Ottoman Empire to modern-day nation-states, the region has grappled with the challenge of balancing the demands of centralized governance with the aspirations of regional autonomy and self-determination. Like the noble houses of Dune, regional actors in the Middle East often seek to assert their autonomy and independence from centralized authority, leading to a complex interplay of competing interests and power dynamics, through our analysis, we aim to illuminate the similarities in power dynamics and political structures between Dune and the Middle East. Offering insights into the complexities of governance and authority in both contexts. By examining the quest for power and influence within noble houses in Dune and the political dynamics of the Middle East, we gain a deeper understanding of the enduring challenges and complexities of political governance in both fictional and real world settings, religious and cultural elements in Dune. In Dune, religion and culture play pivotal roles in shaping societal norms, values, and identities. Central to the narrative is the influence of the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, a secretive order of women who wield immense power through their mastery of mind control and genetic manipulation. The Bene Gesserit's manipulation of bloodlines and their role in shaping the destiny of humanity underscore the theme of religious and cultural influence in Dune, 
Furthermore, the figure of Muad'Dib, a messianic figure prophesied to lead a holy war against the empire, exemplifies the religious fervor and devotion that permeates the world of Dune. As Paul Atreides embraces his destiny as Muad'Dib, he becomes a symbol of hope and liberation for the oppressed freemen, sparking a religious revolution that reshapes the political landscape of Arrakis and beyond, parallels to the Middle East's religious and cultural landscape, drawing parallels to the diverse religious and cultural landscape of the Middle East, we see similarities in the profound influence of Islam, Christianity, Judaism, and other faiths on societal norms and identities. Like the Bene Gesserit in Dune, religious orders and sects in the Middle East often wield significant power and influence, shaping the beliefs and practices of their followers and exerting influence over political and social affairs. Furthermore, the figure of Muad'Dib in Dune bears resemblance to various religious and cultural leaders in the Middle East, whose charismatic leadership and messianic aspirations have inspired movements of resistance and revolution. From the prophets of ancient times to modern-day religious leaders, the Middle East has been shaped by a rich tapestry of religious and cultural influences, each contributing to the region's complex identity and heritage, intersection of religion, culture, and identity. In both Dune and the Middle East, the intersection of religion, culture, and identity serves as a focal point for societal dynamics and power struggles. The clash of religious and cultural values, the quest for identity and belonging, and the tension between tradition and modernity are themes that resonate deeply in both narratives. Through our analysis, we aim to illuminate the parallels between religious and cultural themes in Dune and the Middle East, offering insights into the complexities of identity and belonging in both contexts. By exploring the influence of religion, culture, and identity on societal norms and dynamics, we gain a deeper understanding of the enduring impact of these forces on human society and governance. Colonial Oppression and Resistance in Dune At the heart of Dune lies the narrative of colonial oppression and resistance, as the indigenous freeman population of Arrakis struggles against the oppressive rule of the imperial powers. The freemen, marginalized and exploited by the ruling elite, mount a daring rebellion against the forces of imperialism, seeking to reclaim their land and sovereignty. The Freeman's resistance against colonial oppression in Dune mirrors the historical and contemporary experiences of indigenous peoples in the Middle East, who have faced centuries of foreign domination and exploitation. From the Ottoman Empire to European colonial powers, external forces have sought to control and exploit the resources of the region. Often at the expense of its indigenous populations, impact of colonialism on identity and nationalism in both Dune and the Middle East. Colonialism has had a profound impact on identity, nationalism, and political resistance. The imposition of foreign rule and the suppression of indigenous cultures and traditions have fueled feelings of resentment and defiance among colonized populations, leading to the emergence of nationalist movements and calls for independence. In Dune, the freemen's struggle for liberation is intertwined with their quest for identity and self determination as they seek to reclaim their cultural heritage and assert their autonomy in the face of colonial oppression. Similarly, in the Middle East, the legacy of colonialism continues to shape the region's identity and politics, as nations grapple with the challenges of forging a unified identity in the aftermath of foreign domination, role of liberation movements, both Dune and the Middle East depict the role of liberation movements in challenging colonial oppression and fighting for independence and self-determination. The Freeman's rebellion against imperial rule in Dune serves as a powerful example of the resilience and determination of oppressed peoples in the face of external domination. Similarly, in the Middle East, nationalist movements and liberation struggles have played a central role in shaping the region's history and politics. From the Arab revolt against Ottoman rule to the struggles for independence from European colonial powers, the Middle East has been a battleground for liberation movements seeking to reclaim their sovereignty and dignity. Through our analysis, we aim to shed light on the parallels between colonial dynamics in Dune and the Middle East, offering insights into the complexities of colonialism and resistance. By exploring the themes of colonial oppression, resistance, and liberation movements, we gain a deeper understanding of the enduring impact of colonialism on identity. 
nationalism, and political resistance in both fictional and real world contexts. Gender roles in Dune, in Dune, gender roles play a significant role in shaping societal norms and power dynamics. While women are often portrayed as powerful and influential figures, such as the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood and Lady Jessica, they are also subject to patriarchal structures and expectations. In Dune, the feudal society is characterized by hierarchical relationships and power struggles among noble houses, with individuals vying for status and influence within the imperial hierarchy. Similarly, in the Middle East, social structures such as tribal affiliations, familial ties, and patronage networks play a significant role in shaping power dynamics and societal norms. Through our analysis, we aim to illuminate the parallels between gender dynamics and social structures in Dune and the Middle East, offering insights into the complexities of gender and power. By exploring the intersection of gender with other forms of identity and power, as well as the impact of social structures on power dynamics and societal norms, we gain a deeper understanding of the complexities of gender roles and social hierarchies in both fictional and real-world contexts, conflict and warfare in Dune. At the heart of Dune lies a narrative of conflict and warfare, as rival factions vie for power and control over the desert planet of Arrakis. The Great Jihad, led by the messianic figure of Muad'Dib, unleashes a wave of violence and upheaval across the galaxy, as adherents of his religious movements seek to overthrow the oppressive rule of the imperial powers, the portrayal of conflict and warfare in Dune parallels the historical and contemporary conflicts in the Middle East, where political tensions, historical grievances, and competing interests have fueled decades of violence and instability. From ancient empires to modern-day nation-states, the region has been characterized by a cycle of conflict and war, with each new chapter adding to the complexities of the geopolitical landscape, quest for peace and diplomacy, despite the pervasive nature of conflict in both Dune and the Middle East, there are also moments of hope and opportunities for peacebuilding. In Dune, Muad'Dib's quest for peace and reconciliation offers a glimmer of hope amidst the chaos of war, as he seeks to unite warring factions and forge a new future for humanity. Similarly, in the Middle East, efforts to resolve conflicts and build peace have been ongoing, albeit with varying degrees of success. Diplomatic initiatives, peace treaties, and negotiations have sought to address the root causes of conflict and promote reconciliation among rival factions, offering glimpses of hope for a more peaceful future. Challenges of peacebuilding and reconciliation, however, the road to peace is fraught with challenges and obstacles in both Dune and the Middle East. Deep-seated mistrust. Historical grievances and entrenched interests often stand in the way of meaningful progress towards peace and reconciliation. Moreover, external powers and vested interests may seek to undermine peacebuilding efforts for their own strategic gains, further complicating the task of resolving conflicts and building sustainable peace. Through our analysis, we aim to shed light on the parallels between conflict dynamics in Dune and the Middle East offering insights into the complexities of conflict resolution and peacebuilding. By exploring the portrayal of conflict and warfare, the quest for peace and diplomacy, and the challenges of peacebuilding and reconciliation in both narratives, we gain a deeper understanding of the enduring challenges and opportunities for peace in both fictional and real-world contexts, shared themes and motifs. Our analysis has revealed a multitude of shared themes and motifs between Dune and the Middle East. From the portrayal of power dynamics and imperial politics to the complexities of religion, culture, and identity, both narratives offer profound insights into the human condition and the challenges of governance and society. In Dune, we see echoes of the Middle East's rich tapestry of history, culture, and geopolitical complexity, as characters navigate a world of intrigue, betrayal, and ambition. The themes of colonialism, resistance, and liberation resonate deeply with the struggles of the region's peoples against external domination and oppression. Similarly, the portrayal of gender dynamics, social structures, and conflict resolution in Dune parallels the complexities of gender and power, social hierarchies, and peacebuilding efforts in the Middle East. Through our analysis, we have illuminated the enduring relevance of these themes and their implications for our broader understanding of human society. Politics and governance, significance and implications, 
Our comparative analysis of Dune and the Middle East offers valuable insights for policymakers, educators, and practitioners working in the fields of literature, history, politics, and international relations. By uncovering the parallels between these two narratives, we gain a deeper understanding of the complexities of human society and the enduring struggles for power, identity, and liberation. For policymakers, our analysis highlights the importance of understanding the historical and cultural context of conflicts and crises in the Middle East, as well as the potential lessons that can be drawn from fictional narratives like Dune. By recognizing the shared themes and dynamics between fiction and reality, policymakers can develop more nuanced and effective strategies for addressing the root causes of conflict and promoting peace and stability in the region. Similarly, educators and scholars can draw upon the insights gained from our analysis to enrich their understanding of literature, history, and politics. NSC By exploring the parallels between Dune and the Middle East, students and researchers can gain new perspectives on the complexities of human society and governance as well as the enduring themes and motifs that transcend time and space, future research and scholarship, our comparative analysis opens up new avenues for future research and scholarship, inviting further exploration of the connections between fiction and reality, and the ways in which literature reflects and shapes our understanding of the world. Future studies could delve deeper into specific themes and motifs, such as the role of religion, the dynamics of power, or the challenges of conflict resolution in both Dune and the Middle East. Offering new insights and perspectives on these complex topics, in conclusion, our analysis of the parallels between Dune and the Middle East underscores the enduring relevance of exploring the intersections between fiction and reality. By recognizing the shared themes, motifs, and dynamics between these two narratives, we gain new insights into the complexities of human society and the enduring struggles for power, identity, and liberation. Through continued exploration and dialogue, we can deepen our understanding of the human experience and work towards a more peaceful and just world for all. In the vast expanse of literary and historical landscapes, two entities emerge as focal points of intrigue, power, and complexity, Frank Herbert's science fiction masterpiece, Dune, and the enigmatic political reign of Saddam Hussein, former president of Iraq. Despite existing in disparate realms, one within the realms of fiction, the other entrenched in historical reality, the parallels between these two entities are as striking as they are intricate. This chapter serves as an introduction to our comparative analysis, providing background information on Dune and Saddam Hussein while outlining the purpose and scope of our study. Background information, Dune, Frank Herbert's Dune stands as a monumental work in the realm of science fiction literature. First published in 1965, Dune transports readers to a distant future where noble houses, intricate politics, and mystical forces collide on the desert planet of Arrakis. At the heart of the narrative lies the struggle for control over the most valuable substance in the universe, Spice Melange, a resource essential for interstellar travel and coveted by all who seek power and influence, Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein, born on April 28, 1937, rose to prominence as a key figure in Iraqi politics during the latter half of the 20th century. Serving as the president of Iraq from 1979 until his overthrow in 2003, Hussein's regime was marked by authoritarian rule, political repression, and international conflict. His tenure saw Iraq embroiled in a series of wars, including the Iran-Iraq War and the Gulf War, as well as internal crackdowns on dissent and opposition. Purpose and Scope of the Study The purpose of this comparative analysis is to explore the intricate similarities between Dune and Saddam Hussein's reign, delving into various dimensions of power, authoritarianism, and manipulation that intersect across both narratives. By examining these parallels in depth, we aim to gain a comprehensive understanding of the shared elements between Dune and Saddam Hussein's rule, shedding light on the complexities of governance, leadership, and human nature, thesis statement. Our study seeks to highlight the significance of examining these parallels to deepen our understanding of power dynamics, authoritarian regimes, and the manipulation tactics employed by leaders to maintain control. By drawing connections between the fictional world of Dune and the historical reign of Saddam Hussein, 
We aim to uncover insights that transcend the boundaries of genre fiction and historical reality, offering valuable perspectives on the enduring themes and complexities of human society. Through this comparative analysis, we embark on a journey to unravel the intricate tapestry of power, politics, and manipulation that binds together the fictional universe of Dune and the historical legacy of Saddam Hussein's reign. In doing so, we hope to illuminate the shared elements between these two entities and gain new insights into the complexities of governance, leadership, and human nature. Saddam Hussein's rise to power, Saddam Hussein's ascent to power in Iraq was marked by a series of political maneuvers, internal power struggles, and external conflicts. Born in the village of al Aja near Tikrit in 1937, Hussein rose through the ranks of the Baidh party, a socialist political organization that sought to promote Arab nationalism and socialism in Iraq and the wider Arab world. Following a series of military coups and political purges, Hussein emerged as the de facto leader of Iraq in the late 1970s. In 1979, he officially assumed the presidency, consolidating his grip on power through authoritarian rule, political repression, and the cult of personality surrounding his leadership. Under Hussein's regime, Iraq witnessed a period of internal repression and external aggression, marked by human rights abuses, suppression of dissent, and a series of wars with neighboring countries, including the Iran-Iraq War and the Gulf War. His tenure was characterized by a ruthless pursuit of power and a willingness to use violence and coercion to maintain control over the Iraqi state. Frank Herbert's Dune, against the backdrop of Saddam Hussein's reign, we turn our attention to Frank Herbert's Dune, a seminal work in the realm of science fiction literature. First published in 1965, Dune is set in a distant future where noble houses, political intrigue, and mystical forces converge on the desert planet of Arrakis. At its core, Dune explores themes of power, politics, religion, and ecology, offering a rich tapestry of complex characters and intricate world-building. The novel's portrayal of feudal society, imperial governance, and the struggle for control over the most valuable substance in the universe, Spice Melange, has captivated readers for decades and solidified its place as a cornerstone of the science fiction genre. Saddam Hussein's rise to power Saddam Hussein's ascent to power in Iraq was marked by a series of political maneuvers, internal power struggles, and external conflicts. Born in the village of al Aja near Tikrit in 1937, Hussein rose through the ranks of the Baidh party, a socialist political organization that sought to promote Arab nationalism and socialism in Iraq and the wider Arab world. Following a series of military coups and political purges, Hussein emerged as the de facto leader of Iraq in the late 1970s. In 1979, he officially assumed the presidency, consolidating his grip on power through authoritarian rule, political repression, and the cult of personality surrounding his leadership. Under Hussein's regime, Iraq witnessed a period of internal repression and external aggression, marked by human rights abuses, suppression of dissent, and a series of wars with neighboring countries, including the Iran-Iraq War and the Gulf War. His tenure was characterized by a ruthless pursuit of power and a willingness to use violence and coercion to maintain control over the Iraqi state, Frank Herbert's Dune, against the backdrop of Saddam Hussein's reign, we turn our attention to Frank Herbert's Dune, a seminal work in the realm of science fiction literature. First published in 1965, Dune is set in a distant future where noble houses, political intrigue, and mystical forces converge on the desert planet of Arrakis. At its core, Dune explores themes of power, politics, religion, and ecology, offering a rich tapestry of complex characters and intricate world-building. The novel's portrayal of feudal society, imperial governance, and the struggle for control over the most valuable substance in the universe, Spice Melange, has captivated readers for decades and solidified its place as a cornerstone of the science fiction genre. Saddam Hussein, the strongman of Iraq, in contrast, Saddam Hussein's leadership style is marked by authoritarianism, brutality, and the cultivation of a cult of personality centered around his own image. Saddam's rise to power in Iraq is characterized by the suppression of dissent, the elimination of political rivals, and the promotion of his own mythic persona as the strongman of Iraq. Saddam's regime employs a combination of propaganda, intimidation, and violence to maintain control over the Iraqi state. 
His image is ubiquitous in Iraq, adorning billboards, posters, and currency, reinforcing his status as the undisputed leader of the nation. Like Paul Atreides, Saddam cultivates a cult of personality around himself, portraying himself as a benevolent ruler while ruthlessly suppressing any opposition to his rule, parallels and leadership strategies, despite existing in vastly different contexts, the leadership styles of Paul Atreides and Saddam Hussein share several striking parallels. Both leaders rely on a combination of charisma, coercion, and manipulation to maintain authority and loyalty among their followers. They cultivate a cult of personality around themselves, using propaganda, symbolism, and fear to reinforce their status as divine or infallible leaders. Moreover, both Paul and Saddam employ religious symbolism to legitimize their rule, drawing on the reverence of their followers to enforce their authority. They utilize fear and intimidation as tools of control, suppressing dissent and opposition through violence and coercion. Ultimately, their leadership strategies reflect the complexities of authoritarian rule, illustrating the ways in which power can be wielded and maintained through a combination of charisma, manipulation, and force. By dissecting the leadership styles of Paul Atreides and Saddam Hussein, we uncover parallels in the dynamics of authoritarian rule portrayed in Dune and Saddam Hussein's regime. Through this analysis, we gain insights into the complexities of leadership and power dynamics, as depicted in both narratives, Paul Atreides, consolidation of power, Paul Atreides' ascent to power on Arrakis is marked by strategic alliances, military conquests, and the manipulation of religious fervor. As the prophesied messiah of the freemen, Paul leverages his divine status to unite the disparate factions on Arrakis under his leadership. He consolidates power by forming alliances with influential houses such as House Atreides and House Harkonnen, while simultaneously undermining his enemies through political intrigue and military might, to maintain control over Arrakis, Paul employs a combination of fear and loyalty, using his status as the Kwisatz Haderach to enforce obedience among his followers. He establishes a network of spies, informants, and enforcers to root out dissent and maintain surveillance over the population. Paul's authoritarian rule is characterized by a centralized authority, with power concentrated in his hands as the supreme ruler of Arrakis, Saddam Hussein, reign of terror, in Iraq, Saddam Hussein's regime is synonymous with authoritarianism, repression, and state-sponsored violence. Saddam consolidates power through a combination of political purges, military crackdowns, and propaganda campaigns aimed at glorifying his leadership and suppressing dissent. He establishes a pervasive system of surveillance and control, utilizing a network of secret police, informants, and loyalists to maintain order and obedience among the populace. Saddam's rule is characterized by brutality and coercion, with dissenters and political opponents subjected to torture, imprisonment, and execution. He perpetuates his regime through a cult of personality, portraying himself as the embodiment of Iraqi nationalism and Arab unity while ruthlessly suppressing any challenge to his authority. Saddam's authoritarian rule is characterized by a centralized state apparatus, with power concentrated in his hands as the absolute ruler of Iraq, parallels in political strategies, despite existing in vastly different contexts, the political strategies employed by Paul Atreides and Saddam Hussein share several notable parallels. Both leaders rely on a combination of alliances, coercion, and propaganda to consolidate power and maintain control over their respective domains. They establish centralized authority. With power concentrated in their hands as the supreme rulers of their realms, moreover, both Paul and Saddam employ surveillance, repression, and violence to suppress dissent and enforce obedience among their subjects. They cultivate a culture of fear and loyalty using fear of punishment and loyalty to their person as tools of control. Additionally, both leaders perpetuate their regimes through the manipulation of religious or nationalist sentiment, exploiting symbols and ideologies to legitimize their rule. By exploring the parallels in their authoritarian rule and political strategies, we gain insights into the complexities of governance and political maneuvering in both the fictional universe of Dune and the historical reality of Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Through this analysis, we deepen our understanding of the dynamics of power and control, shedding light on the enduring challenges of authoritarian governance. 
Fear as a tool of control. Fear is a potent weapon wielded by authoritarian leaders to maintain control over their subjects and suppress dissent. In both Dune and Saddam Hussein's Iraq, fear permeates every aspect of society, creating a climate of intimidation and obedience. Leaders exploit this fear to consolidate their power and perpetuate their regimes through manipulation and coercion. Paul Atreides, the fear of the unknown, in Dune, Paul Atreides harnesses the fear of the unknown to assert his authority over Arrakis. Through his prescient abilities and strategic foresight, Paul instills fear in his enemies and allies alike, manipulating their perceptions and actions to serve his own ends. The Freemen view Paul as a messianic figure, fearing his wrath and seeking his favor in equal measure. Paul's mastery of fear allows him to maintain control over Arrakis and navigate the intricate web of political intrigue that surrounds him. Saddam Hussein, the reign of terror, in Saddam Hussein's Iraq, fear is a pervasive tool used to suppress dissent and maintain control over the populace. Hussein's regime employs a combination of propaganda, intimidation, and violence to instill fear in his enemies and subjects. Dissenters are met with swift and brutal punishment serving as examples to others who dare to challenge his authority. Hussein's reign is marked by a pervasive atmosphere of fear. With citizens living in constant dread of the consequences of speaking out against the regime, parallels in the utilization of fear and intimidation, despite existing in vastly different contexts, the utilization of fear and intimidation in Dune and Saddam Hussein's Iraq share striking parallels. Both Paul Atreides and Saddam Hussein manipulate fear to maintain control over their respective domains, exploiting the psychological and societal consequences of fear to assert their authority. Whether through prescient visions or ruthless oppression, both leaders use fear as a tool of control, shaping the behavior and perceptions of those under their rule. Conclusion In conclusion, fear emerges as a central theme in both Dune and Saddam Hussein's Iraq serving as a potent tool of control wielded by authoritarian leaders. By analyzing the tactics employed by Paul Atreides and Saddam Hussein to instill fear in their enemies and subjects, we gain insights into the dynamics of power and control in authoritarian regimes. Through the exploration of fear, we uncover the psychological and societal consequences of living under the shadow of tyranny, shedding light on the complexities of governance and political maneuvering in both narratives. The significance of spice in Dune, spice melange, a rare and valuable substance found only on the desert planet of Arrakis, serves as the lifeblood of the Dune universe. Spice is essential for interstellar travel, enhances mental abilities, and prolongs life. Its control is coveted by noble houses, the Spacing Guild, and the Padishah Emperor, leading to intense competition and conflict over its extraction and distribution, parallels with Iraq's pursuit of WMDs, in the real world, Iraq's pursuit of weapons of mass destruction, particularly chemical and biological weapons, parallels the quest for spice and doom. Saddam Hussein's regime sought to acquire WMDs as a means of asserting its regional power and deterring external threats. The pursuit of WMDs sparked international concern and led to the imposition of sanctions and inspections by the United Nations. Geopolitical dynamics and resource control, the control of resources, whether spice in dune or oil in Iraq, shapes the geopolitical landscape and drives conflict. In dune, noble houses vie for control over Arrakis and its spice production, using military force and political intrigue to secure their interests. Similarly, in Iraq, control over oil reserves becomes a focal point of regional and international power struggles, with competing factions seeking to exploit or control this valuable resource, role of resource acquisition in conflict, the pursuit of resources often serves as a pretext for conflict and war. In Dune, the struggle for control over Arrakis and its spice production fuels interhouse conflicts and the broader political machinations of the empire. Similarly, in Iraq, Disputes over oil reserves have led to regional conflicts and interventions by external powers seeking to secure access to this vital resource. Conclusion In conclusion, the parallels between the pursuit of spice in Dune and Iraq's pursuit of WMDs underscore the role of resource acquisition in shaping geopolitical dynamics and driving conflict. 
Whether it is spice in a fictional universe or oil in the real world, the quest for valuable resources influences the behavior of nations and individuals, shaping the course of history and the destiny of empires. By exploring these parallels, we gain insights into the complexities of resource-driven geopolitics and the enduring relevance of resource conflicts in human society. Societal Structures in Dune Dune portrays a feudal society dominated by noble houses, where power and influence are inherited and consolidated through familial ties and political alliances. Minorities, such as the freemen on Arrakis, are marginalized and oppressed by the ruling class, forced to live in harsh desert conditions and subjected to exploitation. Women in Dune occupy a complex role, with some wielding significant influence and power within the patriarchal structure, while others are relegated to more traditional roles, societal structures in Saddam Hussein's Iraq, in Saddam Hussein's Iraq, power is concentrated in the hands of the ruling Baidih party and the Sunni Arab minority. While ethnic and religious minorities, such as Kurds and Shia Arabs, face discrimination and persecution. Dissenters and political opponents are silenced through violence and intimidation, with dissent often met with imprisonment, torture, or execution. Women in Iraq also face systematic discrimination and oppression, with limited access to education, employment, and political representation, parallels in societal dynamics, despite existing in vastly different contexts. Dune and Saddam Hussein's Iraq share parallels in their portrayal of societal dynamics and cultural norms. Both narratives depict a hierarchical social structure where power and privilege are concentrated in the hands of a select few. While minorities, women, and dissenters face marginalization and oppression, the mechanisms of control and coercion used to maintain social order and suppress dissent are strikingly similar reflecting the enduring nature of authoritarianism and oppression across different contexts. Broader sociocultural implications, the portrayal of societal dynamics in Dune and Saddam Hussein's Iraq raises broader questions about identity, oppression, and resistance. The struggles faced by marginalized groups in both narratives resonate with real-world experiences of discrimination and injustice, highlighting the universal nature of human suffering and resilience. By exploring these parallels, we gain insights into the complexities of power and privilege, and the ways in which individuals and communities navigate systems of oppression and resistance. Conclusion In conclusion, the parallels in societal dynamics and cultural context between Dune and Saddam Hussein's Iraq offer insights into the complexities of identity, oppression, and resistance in both fictional and real-world contexts. By comparing the treatment of minorities, women, and dissenters in both narratives, we uncover common themes and motifs that shed light on the enduring nature of authoritarianism and oppression. Through this exploration, we gain a deeper understanding of the complexities of power and privilege, and the ways in which individuals and societies navigate systems of oppression and resistance. Paul Atreides, the reluctant messiah, Paul Atreides begins his journey in Dune as a young nobleman thrust into a position of leadership following his family's relocation to the desert planet of Arrakis. Initially motivated by a desire to protect his family and seek revenge against those who betrayed them, Paul's character evolves as he embraces his role as the prophesied messiah of the freemen. His personal motivations shift from self-preservation to fulfilling his destiny and leading the freemen to freedom from imperial oppression. There are still many questions and plot points to address towards the world that the director adapted for the big screen. From the ending, to the Bene Gesserit plan, to the adaptation of Alia Atreides and the interesting details on Gaiti Prime, I'm going to be answering some of the biggest questions from Dune Part 2 in the aim to help the non-reader discover things they missed and also aid those who are familiar with the novel to compare the events that took place. This analysis will contain spoilers, so if you do happen to be someone who hasn't seen the film yet, then I would recommend watching this video after you've seen it. Also, a lot of things I discuss continue from what I explained in my breakdown. Before I get into it though, if you want to keep up to date on any of my upcoming content on Dune Part 2 and beyond, then don't forget to support this upload by giving it a like rating, subscribing to the channel and turning on your notifications. But without further ado, let's dive into some of the biggest questions from Dune Part 2 Explained. 
Starting with the ending section of Dune Part 2, there will be many who come out the film and see those final scenes, asking, what's next? And it will be both the book readers who recognize changes from Frank Herbert's book as well as non-book readers who want a better idea of where this might be going. Well, Paul's harsh decision to initiate conflict against the great houses who reject his claim to the throne aims to showcase the depth of his transformation throughout the film. By rallying the freemen to partake in a brutal crusade on his behalf, Paul is fulfilling the prophecy unveiled in his visions, a prophecy that predicted widespread devastation throughout the galaxy. Following the ingestion of the water of life, Paul's dedication to achieving triumph through the narrow path intensified his desire to seize control of the empire. So despite the losses suffered by the freemen, Paul remains steadfast in his quest for power. We get a short final battle, that just like the book, is done this way to showcase the destructive potential of the freemen, wiping out the Sardaukar army and coming face to face with the true appraisers of this story. And when we reach those fateful last scenes, there becomes a slight deviation from the last pages of the novel. That's because in the film adaptation, Paul is portrayed as embracing the freemen's participation in their violent holy war. In the book, he faces down the guild, who aren't shown, and it ends with him ascending and being in full control, while knowing that he's powerless to prevent the bloody jihad, this holy war takes place between the events of the Dune and Dune Messiah novels, and by ending with a more direct acknowledgement of the start of the war, the film seems to adhere to this expanded timeline. However, if the second part ends with Paul openly declaring war, he still gets to the heart of the book's conclusion by emphasizing that his victory comes at a high price. Another aspect of this ending that many readers will wonder is how the final moments represent a change in Cheney's character. Eventually we see Cheney leave Paul and embark on a lonely journey into the vast desert to summon a sandworm. She shows her willingness to face future challenges and it becomes clear that she rejects Paul's ruthless pursuit of power for now.at the beginning of the film, Jessica expresses her sympathy for Paul, while Cheney decides to distance herself. This decision is the result of Paul's behavior towards religious extremism, which strongly contradicts Cheney's Freeman beliefs in the film. But in a heartbreaking moment, Paul reassures his mother and says, she'll understand, I saw it. This statement alludes to future events described in Dune Messiah, the second novel, set again several years later when complications arise between Cheney and Princess Irulan. Director Denis Villeneuve sets fundamental things in motion with the drama so that the Messiah plot is the main driving force behind this adaptation. At the end of the first book, we don't show Cheney leaving Paul, but rather her being nervous about marrying Errol and Jessica, and then comforting. By telling him that even though they are just concubines, the story becomes her remembered as wives.so when he thought of Messiah, he made some changes, but one could also argue that those changes were made because the director wanted the second part to have a more emotional anchor. Paul's ascension should be portrayed as a battle rather than a cause for celebration, and the most effective way to engage the audience is through the use of Cheney. As he takes it all in, he becomes a less compelling character resulting in a lack of tension on screen. Cheney, who represents the emotional core of the film, is intended to be the character in who sees situations realistically and reflects the audience's view of a messiah like Paul. As the freemen prepare to begin their holy war against the great houses, the wait for the next film about the powerful messiahs continues, the looming conflict sets the tone of the story and gives it depth. A more optimistic conclusion, including Paul and Cheney's embrace, would seem false as his army prepares for violence, the first book leaves the situation ambiguous and until we get to Messiah we cannot fully appreciate the story that Herbert has in mind. So really, it's a good thing that the director is exploiting the tragic nature of the sequel. The next question many have regarding the events of part two is the portrayal of the freemen in this adaptation and their debates surrounding the prophecy of Arrakis Paradise. When we get to Siege Tabra near the beginning of the film, just like in the book, we learn how precious water is to the freemen, but for this particular adaptation, Dennis emphasized the idea of dispute within the tribe. When Paul and his mother arrived, we learned that the southern freemen believed he was the prophesied Lisan al-Gay, while other tribes further north did not believe it. 
Stilgar tries to convince the Siege Council to believe in the prophecy after describing to them what happened to Jamie's at the end of part one and pointing out that Paul already knows many of their customs. But Stilgar has difficulty convincing anyone to believe what he says. Paul also tells his mother in the prologue that she is the one doing this because the Bene Gesserit implanted this prophecy. But in the moments that follow, between Jessica and Stilgar, we learn the importance of water and its connection to Freeman prophecy. Once the water from Jamie's body was extracted and added to the entire cave's lakes, Stilgar explained the importance of these lakes to Jessica. Jessica learned from him that it was one of thousands of water stores carefully created by the Freeman to help terraform the planet and that the Freeman had calculated exactly how much water they would need to change the face of Arrakis and bring back a great paradise. Lycaines from the first film, also known in the books as Cheney's relative, was the one who helped instill in the Freeman the ultimate dream of turning Arrakis into a garden world. And so, Stilgar and half the Freeman believed that Lisan al Gabe could make this dream come true. When they saw the signs and when they saw that everything was going as the prophecies had predicted, the southern Freeman became even more convinced that Paul was Lisan al Gabe. And the disbelieving northern Freeman see it all as lies and false prophecies. The idea of northern and southern freemen is not mentioned in Frank Herbert's book, and rather, some freemen disagree with certain aspects of the prophecy in Paul's introduction to surname. But in combining these different perspectives with different freemen tribes, I think Villeneuve did so for several reasons. One is to make the ending with Cheney and the freemen much more dramatic, and the other is to tie in with the main theme of the book the idea of skepticism about charismatic leaders. And that brings us to how the Bene Gesserit plane connects to it and what the central figures of the order do to maintain power in this adaptation. The prophecy of Lisan al Gabe, although a tool used by the Bene Gesserit for manipulation, pales in comparison to the true power that the Kwisatz Haderach possesses, which explains Paul's remarkable success in convert others into believers. Therefore, the line between propaganda and genuine prophecy becomes increasingly blurred. This is not limited to the planet Arrakis, and the Bene Gesserit did not specifically intend for Paul to fulfill this prophecy. Their goal was to create a messiah-like figure whom they could manipulate and influence. Paul Atreides and Fate Rotha were both intended to play a role in this production, but as the film shows, events unfolded beyond the Bene Gesserit's control. A prime example of how the Bene Gesserit works is shown through the events that take place between Austin Butler's Fade Rotha and Leah Seydoux's Margot Fenring. After Reverend Mother Helen Mohane tells Princess Irulan on the planet Chiton that they have other prospects for the Kwisatz Haderach, we learn that one of them is Fade Rotha on Gaty Prime. He shows potential and impresses Margot Fenring in a gladiator match, but it is stated in the book that the Bene Gesserit want him to be a force for good like an Atreides character. However, when things got worse on Arrakis for the Emperor, they chose to seek out Fade as a potential client. Margot seduced Fade shortly after the battle on her birthday, subjected him to the Gangja Bar test, and soon afterwards described to Mohayim and Irulan of Chiton that her lineage was now secure. And that's because she was pregnant with Fade's child. She informs Reverend Mother that he can be controlled because he is sexually vulnerable, telling us exactly how the Bene Gesserit operate and control those who are part of their plans. More than that, it helps convey the influence the Bene Gesserit have over those in power, illustrating the sexual control they possess, a powerful part of their identity. This explains how the selection plan worked and why they weren't worried about losing Paul because they had more candidates. This also helps explain how fate is a dark mirror to Paul, and even though he and the Harkonnens are described as animals, they are still considered human by Bene Gesserit standards. Speaking of Gaty Prime, there's an excellent black and white or infrared sequence midway through the film in which a number of questions arise in the minds of both book readers and those unfamiliar with the material. Starting with the black and white photos, it's worth noting that Gaty Prime's exterior landscapes are influenced by the infrared color palette. 
as explained in the film when introducing the gladiator match. This is believed to be due to the presence of a black sun orbiting the planet. I found this to be a clever detail that highlights the harsh and cruel nature of Gaty Prime and the Harkonnens. From this perspective, infrared light from the sun could explain why the inhabitants of Gaty Prime mainly wear black and white clothing as well as their brutal behavior. Besides the influence of corporate greed, it is likely that this particular sun also influences the behavior of every living thing on the planet. Likewise, a lack of vitamin D in certain areas can affect mood or lead to depression. In Frank Herbert's Dune, everything is about ecology, which is why the planets shape their personalities and cultures, as evidenced by the contrasting characteristics of the Freeman and Sardaukar. So I found it genius that they used this visual storytelling technique to convey that Gaty Prime has an infrared spectrum sun. I also enjoyed observing the subtle visual elements, such as the Bene Gesserit's robes turning pure white under infrared light and the abstract shapes of the fireworks after the Fade celebration. The overall aesthetic of their planet is reminiscent of the style of H.R. Geiger, effectively emphasizes the contrast between Gaty Prime, Arrakis, Seleucus Secundus, and the Emperor's planet. But moving on, there are other questions book enthusiasts can post on Gaty Prime including an important one surrounding plot changes about poison and whether Fade's blade possesses the whether the property is the same as what is described in the book or not. Similar to the final gladiator he faces in the film, in the novel this gladiator is a captured Atriite soldier. The fighters are said to be under the influence of drugs, but the audience can tell by their actions that this is not the case. According to Herbert's account, this project was the result of a collaborative effort between Fade and Thufur Hawat to consolidate Fade's victory. We find out that this gladiator in question almost kills Fade, and at a crucial moment, Fade says the word scum. Only Fade and Hawat knew that the slave had become weak upon hearing this particular word. And seizing the opportunity, Fade destroyed the gladiator with a poison sword, a move that showed Fade's manipulation as he chose to poison the long sword instead of the smaller sword. The smaller blade is often poisoned according to Harkonnen tradition. However, in the film adaptation, there is no emphasis on the element of the poisoned blade in the scene. They focus on the previously managed position and even that position has been significantly changed. The responsibility for the Atriides' opposition not to be poisoned falls to the Baron, and instead of improving Fade's comfort by poisoning the opposing blade, this aspect has been removed entirely. In my opinion, this change helped make Fade's victory more worthy in the eyes of the public, and in the moments that followed it highlighted the conflict between the Baron and Fade in a different way than what is seen in the book. I think this edit is positive because it raises the possibility that Fade could be the prophesied character. One question that arises regarding the other side of this prophecy concerns the reason for Paul's transformation into the Kwisatz Haderach, as well as the important details we learn in the Water of Life scenes. In the movie, we learn that the Water of Life is created by soaking a small sandworm in water. In order for the Bene Gesserit and Kwisatz Haderach to access their other memories, they must endure pain. They consume toxins and then have to adjust their internal body chemistry to neutralize that poison. The level of control, pain and stress caused by worm juice all contribute to releasing their genetic memory. However, with Paul, it goes further because, as a man, the process essentially opens his inner eye allowing him to gain the ability to the ability to see the entire future. As a result, Paul's attitude changed because he now had insight. Thanks to this, he can clearly imagine all possible future situations. As we discover later in the film, Paul realizes that he must consume the water of life to fully accept Lisan Al Gabe's prophecy and finally gain the loyalty of the Freeman. Jessica, who previously drank the water and had a heightened awareness, revealed this fact to him earlier in the film. And when Paul drank the water, he fully accessed his foreknowledge, but he foresaw that different paths would lead to the victory of his enemies. However, there is a narrow path that gives him a path, forcing him to choose between destruction or following that particular path. Given all the events leading up to this moment, 
of course Paul chose the second solution. And it's important to note that the key narrative point that forces Paul to drink the water and undergo the transformation is Fade's destruction of the siege tower, with the implication that the southern sieges may be the next target. This motivates Paul's decision to get the water and after drinking it, Paul realizes that the jihad will continue to exist regardless of his actions. It's not that he wishes to become a villain but that he cannot bear the inevitable path. It is important to emphasize that Paul undergoes a similarly profound change in the final chapters of the book, although there are slight changes in the sequence of events. In the books, Soderker's revelation of his and his child Cheney's deaths during the raid on Siege Tab occurred shortly before Paul decided to attack Arakeen. Dennis Villeneuve's adaptation changes events so that Tabra is destroyed first, leading to Paul's taking of the water of life and his transformation. Both examples are effective in their own right, and although their child's death may have had a greater impact, the removal of the two-year deadline previously meant that other aspects needed to be changed. Changed and improved somewhat. The removal of Paul and Cheney's child is certainly unfortunate, but its importance in this part of the story is mainly about his death, but there are other ways to emphasize the pain this is sad. The change is necessary to ensure consistency in adjustments and other necessary modifications. I'll dig deeper into this topic in the next video about the key differences, but like I said, I think most of the changes are effective. Regarding Paul's brandy drinking scene, a question was also raised as to how Cheney was able to bring Paul back into a trance while he drank the brandy. Lady Jessica summons Cheney to visit Paul, not knowing that he drank the water and passed out. Paul's signs of life are barely detected and Cheney recognizes his attempt to consume the water of life. This made her angry and Lady Jessica used that voice to force Cheney to help her. And during this event, Stilgar recites the prophecy that Lisan Algabe will be revived by the tears of the desert spring, which we learn is the Freeman name for Cheney. Under the control of the voice, Cheney combined his tears with a small amount of brandy, touched his lips, and it instantly revived him. This revision of the film is intended to emphasize the tragedy of Cheney and Paul. Cheney possesses a secret name that matches the prophecy and her tears have the power to awaken the Kwisatz Haderach after drinking the water of life. However, this does not necessarily imply that she has a predetermined role to fulfill, as it simply reflects her hope for aid should the Kwisatz Haderach appear. Despite Cheney's objections to the prophecy, she is eventually forced to participate in its fulfillment. Paul and Cheney find themselves forced by their respective communities and even family members to take on roles they do not want. Coming to one of the final questions. Many book readers were stunned to learn how Denis Villeneuve approached Alia Atreides and what that meant for the film's structure. It's important to note that Lady Jessica plays a larger role in this adaptation, when Alia is still in the womb. Jessica takes the lead in protecting Paul as Lisan Al Gabe. And despite this, his relationship with Alia remains very important. The revision of Paul's sister effectively maintained the novel's character's strangeness and sense of power. Paul and Jessica interact with Alia, but in the book Alia is born, has adult-like communication skills, and plays a key role in the climax when she kills Paul's grandfather, Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. Villeneuve retains the eerie nature of Alia's character in this new form, as she can communicate like an adult right from the womb. However, the film also hints at other developments to come, as Paul contemplates his future unborn sister, played by Anya Taylor-Joy. She reveals the truth about her family and declares her love for him, while looking across the ocean of water to see Arrakis in the future. This change appears to have been motivated by various factors, including a desire to present a more serious portrayal of the character compared to the silliness of the previous adaptation. That way, it's easier to convey its power, uniqueness, and hint at its important role in the future. This change also resulted in a major adjustment to the timeline of events, as Alia was not born resulting in the story's ending taking place in a shorter period of time. This change has a ripple effect, affecting other factors such as the absence of Paul and Cheney's child as well as the depiction of Paul's training before his final test. 
The scene where Rabin visits the barons, expressing concern about their harvesting operations, now serves as a stand-in for the two-year time jump. Moving the film to a shorter time period allowed for the development of Paul and Cheney's relationship as well as the Freeman's destruction of the Harkonnen Reapers in the following months. I know that some people don't like this edit because they want a more natural depiction of Paul's training and handling of characters like Alia, as described in the book. However, in my opinion, the time jump was executed exceptionally well, and while watching the movie, I never questioned Paul and Cheney's progression during this time because each the scenes surrounding the smaller time jump all seem realistic. It doesn't seem forced to me. However, I realized that a two-year leap would probably improve the effectiveness of this aspect as well. So in the end changes had to be made to ensure a more organic way of presenting the conclusion and I believe Denis Villeneuve has achieved this. In the next Big Differences video, I'll dig deeper into these changes and explain why Dennis made them, this will include the removal of characters like Thufir Hawat and Earl Fenring, as well as changing the role of the guild navigator, among other plot points. But here's my video discussing some of the issues that Dune Part 2 raises. I'm sure there will be a lot more that will come up in the review and other examples you may have picked up. So don't forget to let me know below in the comments. For more videos and news about the Dune universe from Denis Villeneuve, subscribe to the channel and activate your notifications. Also, if you liked this video, don't forget to leave a like and follow me on social media through the links in the description. Natural aura surrounding ko aur bhi zada badhava deti hai. Agar in powers ki baat ki jaye, to ye powers include karti hai incredible martial art process. दूसरे के लाइज यानी कि झूठ को डिटेक्ट करना और साथ ही द वॉइस जो कि एक तरह का वर्बल कंपल्शन है उसे फॉर्मेशन करना इसके साथ ही बेनी गेस्टर सिस्टर्स का अपनी बॉडीज पर टोटल कंट्रोल होता है वो खुद की एजिंग प्रोसेस को स्लो कर सकते हैं जी हाँ डेडली पॉइजन को प्रोसेस कर सकते हैं और यहाँ तक कि वो जो बच्चा कैरी करती है उनके जेंडर का भी पता लगा सकती है उनका साथ ही रेवरेंट मदर्स की बात की जाए तो फिर उनके पास एडिशनल गिफ्ट्स होती हैं जैसे कि अदर मेमोरी यानी कि ऐसी एबिलिटी जिससे कि वो अपनी फीमेल एंसेस्टर्स के माइंड से कनेक्ट हो सकती है अब इन एबिलिटीज को फिल्म में किस तरह से दिखाया गया है किस तरह से अडेप्ट किया जाता है ये देखना काफी दिलचस्प होने वाला है तो आपका इन सब पर क्या कहना है इन कास्ट और कैरेक्टर्स के बारे में आप क्या सोचते हैं हमें कॉमेंट्स में जरूर बताएं साथ ही वीडियो अच्छी लगी हो तो वीडियो को लाइक और शेयर करें